today we're going to solve the exam questions from last year. Uh, I guess we're going to solve at least 12 uh, problems today. And we're going to go in the same order uh, uh, that as, as it appeared in the last year's exam. And the first question is, I'm going to solve the first question. And the first question is, uh, is, is Boolean uh, logic circuits. Um, all right, so let's get started. So the, in, the, in the first question, the, the first question has two parts. In the first part, we're given uh, some min terms and, oh yes, good catch, thanks. If I can find the, all right, very good. And maybe I can hide this one as well. Yeah, cool. All right, so we're given, uh, like there are two parts and in the first part we're given uh, uh, min terms and we are expected to uh, uh, write down the Boolean uh, formula, Boolean equation of these uh, min terms by also simplifying it, right? So these are uh, mainly four bit uh, values and we can, as we, uh, know from the lecture, so we can assign uh, variables to, to those four bit inputs so that we can uh, use them in our Boolean uh, equation. And I'm gonna use basically uh, the common terms we've been using A, B, C, D, and I'm gonna use A for the most significant pin and D for the least significant ones. So let's get started. Um, so I'm gonna start writing the Boolean uh, expression of the min terms that are given, right? So if I'm using A for the most significant bit, I could simply write a, B, C, D for, for the first mean term. And I don't really have to do anything because all of them are ones and you can assume that there are ends over here. And I, I'll just basically continue uh, for all of these mean terms over there. So you can, by the way, stop me whenever something is, I don't know, uh, not very clear. Although these are relatively easier concepts. And yeah, A, B, C, D, but I need to, put a not for D, right? Because I have zero uh, or A, B, C, D, but the least three bits are zeros or uh, A, B, C, D, and the second and the third one are zeros. Um, A, B, C, D, let's, this one is um, A, B, C, D again. Uh, this one and last A, B, C, D, all of them are zeros, right? Uh, is that clear so far how I wrote, write, write down the Boolean equation? Perfect. Uh, so we want to simplify that, right? And you can either like go from here and uh, simplify it by your own observation, but we could also apply Carnot map which is easier the which is which is the easier uh, way of doing it i guess so i'm going to apply carnot map here uh, so you can also apply carnot map by the way as long as it says that explicitly you shouldn't apply carnot map or anything like that uh, for carnot map what i'll do is that i'll have sorry say again Oh, he didn't cover Carnot maps. So you, you don't know how Carnot map works, I guess. Okay, so I'm just gonna do it <laughs> as usual, which I'm not uh, prepared for. <laughs> so um, so what then we're gonna do like based on our observation, I'm gonna just uh, disable this one, right? And let's just try to simplify that as, as uh, we would with the Carnot map, I assume. Um, so what I can do is that I can uh, try to observe the common terms here and then and then from there I can go and simplify things. So let's see what sort of common terms we have over there. Uh, we have BC, I guess BC knots uh, covered in many places. So I can go with the BC knot. Uh, and I have A and D knot. Oh yeah, that's great. Thanks, Girai. Uh, all right, so what is the first common 
So I guess it goes with BCD even. Okay, apparently we can also have BCD. So the strategy that I'm applying here is that I'm trying to observe the, the, the most common terms in this formula so that I can use them to simplify things, right? So the first strategy is to, to be able to find those most common terms that appear in the, in the equation. So, and apparently BCD is one of those. So it goes with uh, A and or A naught. And the second most common one would be uh, AC, apparently. And I can uh, have BD, uh, B, uh, D naught, uh, B naught D. And sorry, there's or here and B naught D naught, right? And the the other term would be here uh, a b and I could use c b uh, c not d not um, c d and c d not. Uh, all right. So let's see what's happening here. Is that so? This is, uh, so I have A, a or A naught here. So this is definitely one, right? So I can simply write B naught, C naught, and D naught. And over there, what I have here, I guess, is uh, AC and or AB. Why is that? Uh, all right. So I guess, so this is, so this is all possible com uh, combinations of B and D, right? So then this means that this is here, that is definitely one. And same as here, this is also definitely one, right? Because I have like C, D, C, D naught, and uh, C naught, D, and C, D naught. So same as here. So meaning that these are one. And simply, I could just write A, C, or A, B naught. And if I want to, I guess, simplify even further, B, C, D. Uh, so I, I'll just use a common term over there and C B not. Okay, this is visible. Okay. Uh, and I would assume that it's not okay to apply Karno map in the exam. That's a good catch, yeah. Any questions for that part? Okay. Uh, so second question is, is a bit more tricky than the first one. Uh, so we're given, given a formula and we want to basically convert it in a way that we only use uh, NOR operations. So for that, uh, there are actually a couple of steps that uh, you should keep always in mind. And then you're going to iterate over these steps uh, to basically check whether like you can apply uh, one of these steps when you're, uh, when you're, um, uh, converting your formula to the version that it, it only includes nor or nant. So those steps are mostly usually start with, first it starts with simplification, all right? So when you have an equation, just basically check whether it is simplified enough. So if it is not simplified, so you can first choose to simplify so that like uh, your, your life is going to be easier solving the question. The second step that we can apply while converting this, this formula is, is De Morgan, De Morgan's law. So we're gonna always keep that in mind as well. Uh, the third one would be, we can always also sometimes apply not not operations, right? Because when you apply not not, you're keeping everything same, changing nothing, but it sometimes helps us uh, 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 get rid of like helps us to actually apply later on apply the Morgan so that we can either have a uh, nor or nant or the last option would be uh, you can either choose to and or or the equation or the like the formula or the uh, term with itself right so we can always choose to uh, and or or things to itself and, and nothing is going to change but still it can help us to to uh, uh, convert things to their null versions. So keeping those in mind, I'm gonna start. This is, all right, this is visible. 
Uh, so, all right, I'm going to start. I'm writing down the equation again. EC, AC, AC and not, and not here. So uh, when I observe, so the term over here, over here is seems okay to me for now, right? This one, because if you just consider this one BC as as one input and AC as another input, what I have here is already a nor. So I don't really want to touch that because it's already relatively in a good form. But what is not okay is is this part. Why? Because I have all of two terms. So I want to basically get rid of that. I want to start with get, getting rid of that. And so I can either apply De Morgan's law here or not not. So in this case, I'm going to choose applying not not. So you could either also go with De Morgan, but when you have like too many terms, things get complicated. So not not is always easier when you have too many terms. So I'm going to start with that one. Uh, BC, I'm just writing down exactly the same thing not over here and not not over here again, right? So when you look at it here now, so the problem for this part seems to be solved, right? Because I have, let's say two inputs and they are nor, but I wanna basically get rid of either this not or, or the one that, that, is, that belows it, right? So another approach that I can go is Either I could apply De Morgan again, or I'm gonna uh, either end or or with 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 itself of what I have here. So if I'm going with De Morgan after applying not not, it usually is a sign of like going backwards. It's not always the case, but I would be careful uh, if I'm applying De Morgan after not not. And so this time basically I'm just gonna go with like either ending or oring with itself so that I can get it off the the uh, one of these knots over there. So if I do that, so I'm basically just thinking out lot, or I'm gonna think out lot while doing so. Um, all right. Uh, so over here, all right. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write it again, exactly the same thing. A C not right and not. So what I did just write to the stuff. So and uh, now I need to decide whether I should end or or with itself. And don't forget that I have I have uh, let's see I have one more one more not here. So if I apply actually or this means that I have another nor again. So I don't really want to apply and because then I will need to apply more operations so that I can get rid of that and is at, 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 uh, itself again. So if I apply or here, then this means that this looks okay here because I have a nor for this part and this part. All right, so let me see if everything looks fine. The, the not, not, not. Uh, all right, so I have probably one more knot here. Let me see. It's a BC knot, and I applied not knot, right? Yeah, I have one more knot over there. All right. Let me also check with this part just to be, just to make sure. I have AC knot, and this part, okay, not knot. And what I'm doing is basically is, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I'm doing is over there is, yes, I use this knot and also, and also this knot, let me see, yeah. Yeah, sorry for the confusion. So what I'm copying here is like this part. is this part. So this means that I'm actually I'm moving this knot as well. So this knot should be moved uh, over here. This knot is over here. So if you just ignore this one, so I have full knot covering two terms and 
nuts for these ones. This looks okay now to me. Okay, yes, it looks fine. Um, all right, so now I guess like everything is solved except for this one, right? Because I have a node here. Let me highlight that one as well. So I have a node here. I have a node here. Again, similarly, I have a node here. And in the larger part, I also have a node here. So only thing that we didn't solve yet is, is this thing, A naught, and of course, like BC and AC naught. So it's relatively easier to solve a not over there because I can simply just uh, uh, this is a not a not right. So I could apply the Morgan directly to convert it to um, a or a not. So I'm I'm just gonna do that, and what I'm gonna do is is as follows: a a not or b c a c not, and this is nor this is nor. And same thing again, uh, a, a, not, so let's just put one more parentheses, e, c, a, c, not, not, this is nor, this is nor, there should be one more not here over there. And it's of course like there is one more not covering all of these things. So that's the outer part. Uh, Anything that's not clear so far? Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Cool. Is that better? Cool. All right. Uh, so there are two things remaining. And those are, if I can find my red color. Okay. Those are uh, BC and AC not. So I'm gonna solve them separately and I'm not gonna to, going to really insert them here. I'm gonna solve them separately and assume that like they are inserted in the in the formula later on. So in order to solve BC, uh, you can again like either apply the Morgan or not not. Uh, let's go with uh, not not here. Right. And this would mean uh, B not or C not uh, and not uh, exactly. And in order to get rid of these terms, they are nots. I'm going to apply the similar strategy that I applied for A not. And this would be since because like this is BB uh, not not right. So I'm going to do BB not or CC not and not. Yeah. So yeah, everything is solved. I guess I have a nor here, I have a nor here, and this is nor again. Um, and you can assume that this is inserted to here. Similarly, we're going to solve uh, a c not. Again, we could go either way, uh, uh, either with De Morgan or not not. Uh, let's go with De Morgan this time. Uh, Let's A or C uh, not right. And this would mean, uh, so we're applying not not here. Uh, that would be easier if I went with not not, but anyways. Um, A, C, I'm gonna apply not not here. And, uh, this would mean that, uh, all right, then I'm going to you know, see. Uh, I'm basically ordering with itself. It would be easier if, if you went with not not at first because we're approaching to the same uh, terms. Uh, so same. So I be, what I did is just like I ordered this thing with itself, and uh, I guess in order to solve these parts, similar strategy, a 
not or C uh, not same again A A not or C C not. Let me check if everything looks good. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, everything looks fine. All right, so this is the this is this is AC not, and you can just assume that uh, we're going to insert this thing here and this one to here, and finally we should have uh, all nors uh, in the formula. And I also observed that one CC C or C uh, is missing in the solution. I check whether it can be further simplified, so I couldn't see any other simplification. Maybe it's missing from the solution, uh, but that version should be the absolute correct one. Any questions, anything? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, exactly, exactly. As long as like you're super clear about what you, are trying to do, you can just write down your assumption or the way that you're solving the question. And the like, whoever is grading your exam should grade it accordingly. Yeah. Okay, I guess that's all for the first question. Uh, what is the question, John? I can. Uh, let me see. Uh, what they did is A, B, and C, and they are not. Say it again. Oh, yeah. So, but I guess the question is like, cannot can't we simplify the last uh, version further? And the way to do that is maybe student can speak up and then we can hear him or her well for the simplification. Yes, the question is down there. You have not A and C. And then you have not, and then down there you have these multiple not A and A and so on, but you have to twice. I couldn't really hear well, but so I'll, I'll check the further simplification. And if that's the case, I'll write down in the Zoom or uh, like tell one of the colleagues here so that. Way, right? yeah. Maybe we can continue on model. Yeah, yeah, that's that's also fine. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. If you can also write down your answer to model and then we can continue from there as well. Well, I'll check the simplification. If that's the case, I'll let you know as well. Okay. 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 So we have a question, which has a gigantic question part here. <clears throat> so basically this is about Verilog, which the, it's the hardware description language that you used in the, uh, in the uh, labs, uh, in, in several labs, right? So uh, here we, in this question, we have five blank spots in this code, and we are trying to fill it in the most appropriate way. Um, so, uh, to just get familiar with the module uh, here, uh, let's see what it does. So we have something called anval that we don't have the uh, definition here. So we will uh, provide that soon. And we have two always blocks, right? 
So this block and this block. So let's say this is A, this is B. Uh, you can even draw the circuitry, right? So you can have an A, you can have a B. And uh, if you look at the right-hand side of the equations here, you can see what the inputs of A are. So in the case, we have op, right? So op is one uh, input. We have O data, I data. So these are some other uh, inputs. So these are not really that important for the question itself, but I'm just trying to uh, make it uh, make you more familiarized with the code itself. And then uh, this always block calculates the uh, value of this NVAL, right? So the output is NVAL. And then we have the second always block, uh, which has clock as one input because it's the it's in the sensitivity list of the always block. And uh, we have reset. And we have, okay, so uh, we have some comments saying that here we will reset all data to zero for the next cycle. So the uh, all data will be an output. And uh, this will assign NVAL to all data. So uh, it should use NVAL as an input and all data as an output here, right? So, uh, and you can actually see that NVAL is assigned here and it's connected to here. And all data is also connected to here. So we have this kind of design here. Uh, okay. And uh, when you look at the inputs and outputs of the module itself, you have clock and reset as input. So let's say we have the module here. You have clock and reset and uh, I cannot see, okay. IData is another input. It's actually implicit in the name, but don't get tricked by the name. So it's it's defined as input. And there's a, uh, another input called op. So these are like uh, op is two bits wide and uh, IData, IData is uh, 16 bits wide and clock and reset are just like one bit. And then we have an O data, and we know that it is 32 bits, but we don't know if it's output or input. Okay, let's start with like how we're gonna complete this code. So for the first one, uh, so we are gonna put O data either as an input or as an output because it's in the IO list of the module itself, right? And uh, it seems like uh, we are uh, writing the, we are, uh, we are assigning the value of all data in this block, right? So in B. So you cannot basically change the value of an input signal. So it has to be an output here, all data. And uh, basically what you should do is uh, uh, basically define it as an output, right? So you can either put this, this, or this, but you cannot put this. Uh, okay, so between these three, we should choose which one to put. So OData is not defined as a register or wire in the module itself. So it has to be defined here. Um, therefore, it it should not be output ideally. Uh, in, in some uh, synthes synthesized tools, you can put it just output. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, but according to rules, it shouldn't be output. and Actually, because of the fact that uh, this uh, value of ODIDA is determined by an always block here, which is the second block, um, it has to be a register because the uh, whatever uh, whatever is output of an always block has to be registered. You cannot assign wires in always blocks due to the syntax rules. Uh, therefore, it has to be output register. Okay, let's move to the second one. So uh, here we have NVAL. So NVAL's value is determined by the first block here and it's uh, used in the second block as an input. And uh, we see that the initial value of NVAL is a 32 bits long value, right? So it has to be a register and it has to be 32 bits. So it has to be this one. 
And why it has to be registered? Again, it's registered because uh, the value is determined by an always block. Uh, is there a question so far? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, technically you can write it like, okay, maybe just right here, and well, and then turn it to a bit zero, right? And then this will be just like one bit. And uh, the value here on the right-hand side of the equation is like zero. So it will get the value of zero. And if you try uh, mapping some other 32-bit number to here, uh, assigning it another 32-bit number, it will get the least significant bit in the like common use case, let's say, if you write it in that way. But uh, ideally, you shouldn't do that. Yes, synthesizers are okay with that, but uh, to make your design robust, you, you shouldn't do that, actually. Yeah, does it answer the question? Okay, perfect. So uh, also in the, among these options, we don't have any like other bit length anyway. It's just like all of them are third bits. So we need to decide if it's register input wire or int. So it has to be registered because it's written by the always block. Okay, uh, the third one, third one is here. So here we have a case statement here, right? So, uh, you can imagine how case is implemented in a way that it's just a multiplexer. Uh, do you remember the multiplexer from combinatorial uh, logic? Uh, okay, I hope you will remember that. So uh, if you actually try implementing this, it's basically something like, okay, you can see this part. This is like a multiplexer and you have two bit uh, select signals here, which is op. Let's say it's like this op, and it's two bit wide. And uh, you have different uh, options here, right? For like uh, all possible values of op, and uh, your output is nval. And you assign nval to o data plus i data if the op is zero zero. So it goes to this place for example so i hope it's so i'm not gonna put everything here but i hope it's clear so here uh, we have the uh, the uh, uh, possible values listed as 0, 0, 0, 001 and 10 so for the fourth one we can have two options actually it can be one one or uh, syntax also allows you to just write default meaning that if it is not any of these, it will go to default, right? So let's see what we have here. So we have this uh, two bit binary three, which is completely illegal actually, because if you put B here, you need to write the number next to it as in binary form. And in binary, you only have zero and one, you don't have three. So you cannot actually write it. Uh, this is three bit three. Uh, and it's binary. It's also wrong because, uh, again, the same reason. And here, uh, this H means hexadecimal. So when you have two bit number, hexa in hexadecimal for form, the value is uh, one one. So if you remember hexadecimal, let's say this is a hexadecimal number, one one, right? So when you convert it to binary, it will look like this. because each digit goes to like four bits. So this will result in, since you define it like two bit long, it will get the probably the, get, get the least significant two bits and it will map to this two bit zero one actually, which is wrong. So you cannot do this as well. So you cannot do any of these. And you have the option default here. So it works just fine here. Okay, so let's move to the fourth and fifth. So here, um, 
if you remember, there's a difference between always blocks that are triggered with uh, any input and that are triggered with uh, the uh, post edge or nail edge of some signal in the CSS clock. So if you clock gate um, these uh, always block, then uh, it's it's a convention in Verilog that you have to use these non-blocking assignments. If you remember, there were uh, there were different assignment types. So if you just use this equal, just like here, it's a blocking assignment. Uh, that part of the code goes sequential, but uh, you don't want to have that sequential uh, uh, method in the clock triggered circuitry because you need to run it as fast as possible and as parallel as possible. So we also have non-blocking assignments written like this. Uh, so we need to go for these ones. And uh, uh, of course, in always block, you just write the name of the signal and then the uh, uh, value. So here uh, we have assign statements, for example. So maybe you you remember uh, uh, writing assign in your Verilog codes. You write assign if you're writing it outside of a always block. If it's inside an always block, you don't use assign. So this these are wrong. These are wrong. So we have these options here for four and five. So for four, it should reset all data to zero. So this one resets all data to zero in an unblocking way, right? And what, what does this one do? It just compares if all data is zero. So it's like two equal sign, meaning like if statement, right? So it just checks if it is uh, equal. So uh, this is not what we are trying to do. So we get rid of these as well. So for four, you need this non-blocking assignment here. And five, you have this non-blocking assignment here. So this is the first part of the question. Uh, is there any question? Okay. Is someone checking Zoom chat? I, I, I cannot see it here. Okay, perfect. So, uh, okay, this is one of my favorite types of questions. What does this code do? So we are just gonna see, uh, try figuring out what does this do? So here, uh, again, we have two always blocks and one assign here. And uh, if you consider this as a, a sequential logic, uh, you have the sequential part, you have the combinational part, and you have some output circuitry here actually written in a three different parts. So this part is the sequential logic which actually um, you can consider this as like a um, as like a flip flop here, right? And or some sort of latch, basically. Um, so output is state, and uh, so maybe you are not familiar with this syntax. Uh, let me uh, explain it a little bit. So if you have so out here is a two bit signal, right? If you write, uh, I couldn't write like this, then this means uh, this is equivalent, let's say, uh, to uh, feeding all bits in out into an end, end operation and getting the output. So you end all the bits in out. So, uh, this 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 uh, therefore just uh, evaluates one only if 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 I run the, uh, if I write down the truth table here, so for out out value uh, zero 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 one one zero one one right all possible uh, options we have so the uh, uh, okay and out result will be for this zero for this zero for this zero and for this one okay. So this will only evaluate one when both bits are one. And uh, this, this ternary uh, statement tells us that if the condition here is true, then assign this value. If it is false, assign this value to left-hand side of the uh, equation. Okay, not the equation, the statement. 
Um, okay, so uh, it means that there is something called state, which is uh, one bit long, and uh, it starts at zero, and uh, it uh, it is inverted if this out signal is one one, and in all other cases, uh, it just uh, uh, keeps its previous value uh, when a clock signal uh, hits. So okay, and uh, here it's uh, relatively uh, more straightforward. Um, this also works with clock, and uh, it it checks the value of the state. If state is zero, then it increments this myrac, and uh, if the state is one, it decrements myrac, uh, and both operations are by one. Okay, and output is directly connected to <clears throat> excuse me myrac. Okay, so uh, the question asks us to uh, run this uh, circuitry for 16 consecutive clock cycles uh, from the very beginning and uh, show the value of uh, out signal here. Okay, so, uh, so I'm just gonna write it down here. So we have clock uh, at zero, okay, and um, we have the state, we have um, my rag, and out is connected to my rag. So it will be the same anyways. I think I'm not missing anything here. Okay. So in the very beginning, um, the state is zero, right? And my rag is zero. Therefore, out is also zero. Let's write it in binary form. So these are zero, 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 and state is zero, clock is zero, okay. Uh, I move to the first clock. So when the clock hits, we will run this always block and this always block in parallel, meaning that um, the result of one is not gonna affect the other one in the same clock cycle. So here, uh, uh, out is zero, zero. Therefore, uh, this will just keep the previous state and my state is gonna stay at zero. And uh, state was zero in the previous clock cycle. Therefore, my rate is gonna be incremented by one. So it will be zero one. And output is directly connected to my rate. So it will be zero one as well. And let's move to the second one. Um, so here, uh, my rate out is zero one. Therefore, the state will remain as zero because of this, right? Because, uh, yeah, this, this is not satisfied, then state is going to stay the same. And uh, this will increment by one, and then this will follow my right. This is increment by one because state was zero here. Okay. Uh, now I think uh, things are going to get uh, a little bit more interesting. So here in the third clock cycle, we look at uh, uh, the, let's, let's look at the state. So Okay, it's not interesting still because it's one zero here out. So this 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 value is gonna be zero again. So we are gonna um, maintain the uh, previous state. So state will be zero and my rate will increment again and it becomes one one. And one when my rate becomes one one, our output is also one one. Okay, now things get more interesting. So here uh, output is one one. Finally, this uh, end out uh, 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 signal here uh, goes to one. So when this goes to one, state will be inverted. So the state will be one uh, here. So we invert it here. And uh, here uh, to calculate my rec, uh, I will still use the state from the previous clock because uh, those two always blocks run in parallel. Therefore, I will uh, try incrementing this. So when you increment uh, a two-bit number with value three, what you get, you, you, you normally should get four, right? Three plus one is four, but it will overflow in the most significant bit. So you will have zero, zero here. Okay, is that clear? And when this becomes zero, zero, output is also zero, zero. Now output is again, uh, not one one, therefore we maintain the state here. And therefore we need to decrement my rack. 
And when you decrement my rack, so here your value is zero. So zero minus one is minus one. Uh, so how you, what you get in binary form is again one one here. Okay, so the output is also one one. And uh, when output is one one, uh, in the next state, you will invert the state. So in uh, state is going to be zero. And uh, to calculate my right, we need to look at the previous state again because those always blocks are parallel. So it will decrement my right. So my right will be one zero. And when this becomes one zero, output also becomes one zero. And when output becomes one zero, you will maintain the current state in the next clock and it will be zero. And when this will, when this is zero, uh, you increment this again, uh, my right, and my right goes from one zero to one one, and output also goes to one one. So I guess you start seeing some pattern here. If you look at in decimal form, maybe it's more clear. So I'm gonna write out in decimal form here. So it's zero here, one, two, three, right? And then it goes back to zero, and then three, and then two, and then three. And if we run one more, what will happen? So here, uh, output is one, one. Therefore, you will invert the state. This will be one. And the state was zero in the previous clock cycle. So you will decrement it. And it will go to one, zero. Therefore, it will be two again here. So what happens is, until this point, maybe you can consider that as a initialization process. Did I do something wrong? Let me double check. Maybe I missed something. So here two. Oh, okay. I missed this one. So it was state zero here. So the my rate should be incremented. I decremented it. So you need to increment from one one. So this becomes zero zero. So this is zero again. And then in the ninth one, since this is zero zero, this will not change. And then this will be uh, decremented. So it will be one one. And then the output is going to be three. So every two clock cycle, you invert your state. So it's going like two up, two down, two up, two down in the output, right? So what pattern you see is uh, it goes from zero to three, and then two, and then three, and then zero, and then three, and then it will go to two again here, and then three again here, and then zero, and then three again, and then two. So you will see this kind of pattern. So uh, I'm not going to continue doing this. Uh, you can, if you're not convinced that this pattern is repeating here, you can just try seeing it yourself. Uh, but this is the answer, basically. And if you look at the solution, actually, there's a huge paragraph explaining this, but I tried to uh, explain it in a more intuitive way. So I hope this is helpful. Um, yeah. Uh, it is correct if both uh, always blocks are triggered with post edge clock. Okay, this is a bit uh, crowded now. Maybe I should uh, show it here. Where's that? Okay. So yeah. So in, when you look at sensitivity list, both of them are triggered with post edge clock. So they should get the value from the like before post edge clocks come, comes. So the, the, even though their output has, outputs are connected to each other, uh, so it's it's basically like this, right? So let's say this is A, and this is B. 
you have A here, you have B here, and both of them are triggered by clock signal. And you use A's, A's uh, output as B's input here. So when the clock hits, uh, it gets the value here and then writes it here, right? And at the same time, B gets the value here and writes it here. Just consider that like to simplify things, just assume that these are two D flip-flops. Therefore, the value here does not propagate until this wire, uh, until like two clock cycle passes. Therefore, you have to use the value from the previous clock cycle for this uh, default flop. Uh, yeah, so if, if you... Yeah, so then uh, if you consider that uh, uh, what kind of circuitry it should try implementing. So A assigns, let's say we have state here, right? A assigns a value to state, B assigns another value to state. So there's, there's a conflict here. So you don't know which one is gonna be uh, here. Actually, if you try doing that in uh, Vivado or ISE, then you will get a warning or error saying that this is uh, this the signal is driven by multiple sources. Sure. Other questions? Okay. So we are doing finite state machines. This should be hopefully the easiest uh, of the exercise in the exam. So easy points. Um, it's mostly a question of reading, uh, reading the problem statement right and not making stupid mistakes. <laughs> um, so uh, let's go through this. Uh, you're given this melee machine. Uh, this one input bit, one output bit, and um, you should uh, try to simplify it um, and reduce the number of states. So you should explain each step and draw the thing. Um, and well, okay, this is the sentence, if not, and so on. But let's try to do it first. <laughs> uh, so we should try to get to fewer states. And the first step is probably to check is anything useless in this machine. So a useless state would be one that's never reachable and we can immediately see c does not have an input edge actually so this one can never be reached we can remove it and of course also the outgoing edges from c would never be used so uh, the question also asks to write out an explanation so we do that uh, c is unreachable So for your benefit, I will be uh, very short in my writing here. So maybe you can write in the exam a few, a bit more than just three words, um, but you know, say so something like there's no incoming edge, it's unreachable, can be removed. Okay, so after we removed C, um, now we actually can repeat the same step. Uh, now D is unreachable, the same reason, and it's outgoing edges as well. So afterwards, D is unreachable. Okay, and now we are left with a fairly simple automaton. Um, we can try to remove more states, but uh, as you can see here, somehow in state A, we behave differently than in state B because for the input bit zero, we output the zero, while over here for the input bit zero, we output the one. So uh, we cannot combine these states for sure. And the automaton cannot be reduced further. So as the final step, we should draw the resulting automaton. So this is A, the self loop, 
reset. Don't forget to reset. I apologize for my terrible handwriting, but hopefully it's legible. Um, all right, so for the second step, uh, you should try to execute some steps in this automaton. Um, so we process binary numbers, and it's important that we go from the, actually you have to be careful about the, uh, bit order. So we go from the least significant bit to the most significant bit. So uh, you, give, you get this input string. And what's important here is this specification here means that you read it from right to left, which could be an easiest mistake in the exam. So you read it like this. It's specified from least significant to most significant. And now we should just calculate what the output stream should be. So we can go up here and check in the machine. We start with a zero. So we go to a zero, we stay in A. We go to another zero, we stay still in A. We go to one, we go to B. Now we get a zero and actually each input bit now gets inverted. So any one input bit becomes a zero, any zero input bit gets a one. While before in A, we yeah did not invert the inputs. So let's see, and as long as we only got zeros, we did not invert the input bits and gave them direct less output until we get the first one. The first one we still print as a one to the output and afterwards we invert every bit. So let's, uh, yeah, you can write this as an explanation but the exercise doesn't require it. You can just manually execute this uh, FSM or get this intuition. But anyway, whatever you do, you should get to zero, zero, one. So these are the first three bits. We're still in A. With this one, we go over to B. And now we invert every further bit. So let's see. The next zero becomes a one. The next one becomes a zero. And one, zero. All right. That's that. Simple enough. Is there any questions so far? No, great. <laughs> All right. Um, so again, it's mostly a question of reading the question precisely. So you should design a more type machine, um, which by the way, they gave this nice hint here. So, uh, Recall that the output depends only on the current state on the more machine. So the previous exercise, we had outputs for every edge. Here we did need to design a more machine which has an output for every state because it's a more machine. Okay, um, the, so let's see, the input is again an unsigned binary number. Uh, and you get it as a bit serial fashion, but interestingly now <laughs> we get it from the most significant bit to the least significant bit. So you really need to read this carefully in the exam because this time it's from left to right. Um, so let's see, the output should be a logic one, exactly if the input so far is divisible by eight. Okay, we got everything. Um, so they gave some examples here for which inputs this should be a one. Uh, let's see. So divisible by eight really means the last three outputs. So for the ones, the twos and the fours are all zero. That's why you can see in these examples here that really all the ones that you should accept are, yeah, have this end in these three zeros. Right. If any of these three bits were a one, it would be maybe an odd number or a number that has a, a two in it or a four. Um, 
Uh, and as soon as you find these three zeros, you can be sure it's divisible by eight. The way to define it also, like a zero by itself is also divisible by eight because it's zero modulo eight. Um, so that's uh, all the question reading we have to do. Uh, so we should uh, write an explanation also for the SF FSM we're designing. Um, so what we should write down is something like, okay, we, we had this insight that uh, we detect the uh, three zeros at the end of the inputs. And, and yeah, you, you should write this a bit more precisely than I'm doing it right now, and maybe a bit more. Um, you should also explain the exact states. So we should design an FSM that has, yeah, basically you can detect it. So you have maybe a state uh, S0 that holds all values that are divisible by eight. So this would be ones that end in three zeros. And if you from this state go um, and get next AA1, let's say, then we could call the state S1. Uh, just the intuitive labeling is a one, maybe our intuition for it. Okay, so we go here as soon as we read as a one as the next bit. This would mean that we went from something that's divisible by eight to something that's no longer divisible by eight because it just became an odd number because we read a one. Um, now, if from this state you read another one, nothing interesting happens because you are still not divisible by eight. Um, and from the state, you could go to a state S2, which would mean the current bit you read so far ends in one zero. So you go there. And from here, if you read another zero, maybe go to state S3, which means you end in one zero zero. Okay. So on a zero, and if you read two zeros already, and now you see another third zero, then we are divisible by eight again. All right, so far so good. Now we are missing some edges here. So we need a reset edge because as uh, we defined up here, zero by itself is divisible by eight. So that's where we start. We are initially divisible. And if you are initially divisible, we remain divisible if you add more zeros. Um, let's see, if we so far read one zero and we read another one, we are again no longer divisible by eight and we most recently read the one. And if you read one zero zero and read another one, we also will not be divisible by eight for some time. Okay. So it's important to have defined what the output edges are for each input and uh, yeah, define the reset edge. And what's still missing now is the output bit. So the output bit should be logic one, exactly if you're divisible by eight, this is the case exactly here. So output O is one, output O is zero here. Output O is also zero here. Output O is also zero here because we're not divisible by eight in any of these states and we are divisible by eight here. All right. Yeah. The exercise asks for an explanation of these states. You should probably give an intuition what, what this zero, 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 one, zero, zero, one, zero, or this one here means. You can of course rename them to whatever is most intuitive to you. Is there any question? Trivial, right. all right. <laughs> um, yeah, hopefully this exercise works well in the exam. Then I'm done here and... I believe uh, you should get full credit from this uh, simple questionnaire. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, I'm Ji Sung Park, a postdoc in Safari Research Group. Uh, let's dive into the four questionnaires. 
So yeah, let me read first. Uh, let me read the question first. So a new CPU has two comprehensive user manuals available for purchase, which describe uh, the ISA and the microarchitecture of the CPU respectively. So unfortunately, the manuals are extremely expensive and you can only afford one of the two. If both the manuals uh, might be useful, you would prefer the ISA manual since it is much cheaper than the microarchitecture manual. So for each of the following questions that you would like to answer, uh, decide which manual uh, is more likely to help, okay? So basically this question uh, is asking if you clearly understand what the ISA and microarchitecture manuals uh, should uh, uh, describe. Uh, so uh, let me briefly recap uh, the ISA and microarchitecture. And by definition, uh, the ISA is the interface uh, between program and hardware, right? So, uh, and in this program uh, is not just only uh, the high level uh, programming language such as C++ or Java, it should include uh, any programs. So on top of hardware like assembly code or even machine code, machine binary code, right? So uh, typically at the end of the program layer, uh, we describe uh, the program behavior, meaning the hardware behavior using instructions, right? So ISA should define the type of instru instructions uh, that are supported by this hardware and also the uh, format of instructions. But uh, how to implement, exactly execute uh, the instructions, uh, the ISA manual does not have to specify them. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, let's go over the question now. So the number of uniquely identifiable memory, so yeah, before we go uh, over the each question. So my point here is that uh, I would suggest you think about the necessity uh, over the given information in each question here from the programmer's perspective. If the information is really necessary uh, to, for a programmer to implement a code, uh, then it should be described in, ISA, uh, in the ISA manual. But if the information could be useful to optimize the performance of whatever of your program, but it's not really essential to uh, make a program itself, then uh, the ISA does not have to specify, it. okay? So number of uniquely identifiable memory locations, it means the memory space, right? And a programmer should be able to specify the exact location of each variable, program variable. So this should be uh, properly described, uh, defined in ISA. Hope it is clear. And the number of instructions of pet fetched per clock cycle. So this is, uh, this can vary depending on the uh, exact microarchitectural designs. So in, if you recall the assembly code, we uh, took a look in course. Yeah, there is no specification uh, in our like assembly code, right? So uh, it can vary. So this should be, so the ISA, uh, manual does not have to specify this. And support for branch prediction hints conveyed uh, by the compiler, meaning that uh, the compiler, when uh, the compiler generates the final code, uh, machine code, um, to, to use this uh, branch prediction hints generated from the hardware, there should be a way uh, for the compiler, it's a software also, right? Uh, to get such information from the hardware, meaning there should be some instru dedicated instruction. So ISA should specify that. And number of general purpose registers, for sure it should be described in ISA because a programmer should be able to specify the destination and source of registers. But uh, the next, uh, the number of non-programmable registers so literally this, these are non-programmable. So there's no way uh, to, uh, for a programmer to 
specify the use of this non-programmable register. Th these are used for some other optimization inside the hardware. So yeah, it does not have to be specified in ISA. And CMD processing support. I think uh, this question is a tricky one uh, because uh, usually CMD processor, even if a processor uh, supports CMD uh, operations, uh, the processor should be able to run a program that does not have any, meaning that the, any uh, CMD processing features, meaning that uh, a programmer should be able to design a program that does not use any CMD features, right? But to correctly use this uh, CMD pro processing features uh, that are supported by the hardware, uh, the instruction, some there, there, should be, there should exist some instruction dedicated to CMD processing. So it should be specified in ISA, right? And number of integer arithmetic and logic units. So again, so this is how to execute, uh, efficiently execute uh, some arithmetic or logic uh, instruction. So it can vary depend uh, across the different microarchitectural designs. Okay. And number of read ports in the physical register file. Yeah, typically you may already know yeah, in our common uh, program, uh, such information is not included uh, in our code, I would say. So this also should be, so does not have to be specified in the ISA for sure. So the point is that, yeah, you, you may be able to say that, okay, so there could be some instruction set architecture and microarchitecture manuals, uh, which is a very simplified or uh, in the opposite, very, uh, they can provide us very micro controls in ISA level, but we are talking about common principles, right? So thinking about, uh, so questioning the common principle uh, is definitely good for research to advance the technology. But in this question, we are talking about the common principle. So Indians, I assume that uh, you are, uh, you clearly understand uh, what NDNS is, right? So because, so the programmer should be aware of uh, the big NDNS used in the certain hardware because uh, otherwise the machine translates uh, the value of uh, the certain value in a different way we intended, right? From we intended. So it should be specified uh, in the ISA manual. And size of a virtual memory page and yeah, typically in, in common um, CPU and uh, CPU architecture, uh, the, the instruction always deals with, uh, each, an instruction always deals with uh, virtual memory address and the address is translated to physical address and it involves a, a lot of hardware typically. So there is a, a, an agreement between the programmer and the hardware, uh, hardware itself so that yeah, the virtual memory uh, translation is correctly done as intended. So this should be also uh, described in the ISA. And cache coherent pro coherence protocol and number of cache blocks in the uh, in the L3 cache. Uh, these uh, are not necessary to be specified in ISA because you know, the cache implementation, this is implementation to tolerate uh, the long memory latency. So it depends on the microarchitectural design of the CPU. But uh, ability to flush a cache, cache line using the operating system code, meaning that, uh, so yeah, to uh, figure, it, figure this out, um, the programmer uh, needs to know, right? So it is kind of also contract between the <clears throat> between a programmer and the hardware. So it should be uh, specified in uh, ISA. And number of pipeline stages. Again, this is implementation. Uh, we already uh, covered uh, various possible uh, uh, pipeline designs, like multi-stage and uh, pipeline state pi pipeline execution. So there could be only one uh, pipeline stage even, right? So this should be also, uh, 
found in microarchitectural manual. And last, uh, how many prefetches uh, the hardware prefecture generates in a clock cycle? Yeah, this is also um, implementation of the uh, memory request, right, to optimize the performance. So this does not have to be uh, specified in the ISA manual. Hope everything is clear. So do you have any question? So this is the performance evaluation question. Uh, this question first. So here we're having a multi-cycle processor, P1, uh, that is execute load instructions in six cycles, store instructions in six cycles also, arithmetic instructions in two cycles, and branch instructions also in two cycles. And then you have application A, where we have a breakdown of instruction. So you have 40% um, of all instructions being load instructions, 20% of all instructions uh, being stored, and 30% of all instructions being arithmetic instructions, and 10% of all instructions being bridge instructions. So the first question here is asking what is the CPI of application A when executing on processor P1. So CPI, if you're not remember, if you don't record, means cycles per instruction. And, and we are interested here on the average CPI for the application, right? So for you to calculate the average CPI for that application, you simply is we are going to simply multiply uh, and add all of those uh, cycles that it takes per instruction and the amount of instruction that the application is going to execute in the application. So it means that first we are going to see uh, the application executes 40% of, of the instructions are load instructions, right? So that means that you're going to multiply 0 0.4 times the latency that it takes in cycles of load instructions, which is six cycles. So times six plus, and then you repeat for each instruction type. Then you have 20% uh, being stored instructions. So it's going to be 0 0.2 times the latency of stored instructions, uh, which is also six cycles, so times six plus and the amount of arithmetic instructions, 30%, so 0 0.3 times the latency of uh, arithmetic instructions, which is two cycles, two times two, plus the branches, uh, 0 0.1 over here, times the latency of the branches, which should be two cycles. So here we have, uh, this number of cycles that is uh, that is going to take for load instructions, for store instructions, for arithmetic instructions, and for branch instructions. And if you do this math, uh, I, I guess it should give you uh, 4.4. So this is the final value. Is there any question related to this uh, in the audience? Okay, I'm assuming there is not. And then in part B, uh, it, it says that a new design of the processor is going to double the, freak, the clock frequency of processor P1. However, the latency of all instructions uh, increases by four cycles. Uh, we call this processor P2. Uh, the compiler used to generate instructions for P2 is the same as in P1. Uh, does it produce the same number of instructions of pro uh, program A? And this is all, of, all this information is going to be important for the next question. Uh, what is the CPI of application A when executing in processor P2? So pretty much we do the same thing. So CPI. But now uh, the breakdown of instructions is the same because it's in the compiler is generating the same number of instructions. Um, the only thing that is changed is that we are going to increase the cycle, cycle number of cycles for each instruction by four. So now you're going to have uh, here 0 0.4 because these are the 
number of load structures times. Now the latest that is going to take uh, for load structure is going to be six, what was the original latency here, uh, plus four, because the, we are going to increase the cycle of all of these structures by four. Then we do the same thing for the storage functions times the original latency was six, we incremented by four. And then for the ultimate instructions, the original latency was two, we incremented by four. And finally, the branch instructions, the original latency was two, uh, and we incremented by four. And I guess this should give you 8.4 if I don't mistaken. Um, any question related to this? Um, there is something in the chat. How much would be get deducted if you got the wrong result by calculating errors, but not the formula? Okay, so usually I'm the one grading this question. So I don't deduce much uh, if you do math mistakes. Um, uh, like I like this is 10 points, right? I would do like one point or something, uh, depending on how bad is the error, or if I can clearly see if the error is a math mistake rather than a uh, um, uh, uh, formula mistake, like meaning if I understand that you know the formula, but you just multiply something wrong, I would not deduct, deduct much at all. Uh, so it's really important when you do this performance evaluation question to first uh, write down the equation, similar to what I did here in the first part, uh, breaking down each part of the equation so the theory that is grading understand that you manage to, you know exactly what you're doing related to the equation itself. Um, and then uh, when the, the, if there is an error uh, for math later on, uh, uh, the TA would know to not deduct much for that because uh, what we want to evaluate is if you understand the concept, right? What CPI, for example. Uh, so yeah, I guess this is, um, I guess this answers the question. Okay, so I'm going to go to the next question. So he's asking which process is faster and by how much. Uh, sure. And then the most important equation uh, here is going to be the equation for execution time. Execution time. So execution time, if you recall from the lecture, is equals to the number of instructions that the application executes times the CPI times the, the one over the clock frequency. So if you if you apply this question this equation here um, for application for processor one, we are going to have the execution time is going to be the number of instructions times CPI of processor one, uh, which is uh, four point four times the clock frequency and just put F here. And the execution time of processor two is going to be this, the, the number of instructions executed. Um, recall that in the previous question, we said that um, the compiler used to generate the instructions for processor P2 is the same as P1. Does it produce the same number of instructions of pro program A for program A? So it means that this instruction here and this instruction here is the same number. Uh, times the CPI of processor P2, which is 8.4 times the frequency. So a new design of process double the clock frequency of processor P1, right? So if this frequency of processor P1 is F, these other frequencies here is going to be 2f, right? So if you simplify, if you divide one equation by the other, or simplify the equation, uh, we can we can see here 
So this instruction is the same as this instruction, right? This one over F term here is the same as one, this one over F term here, so you can cut. So we are going to have that, uh, this is going to be, uh, we can say that this is like, this is 4.4 and this is 8.4 divided by two, which is uh, four, this is uh, 4.2. So execution time, uh, lower is better, right? So uh, the execution time of the, after the simplification of the execution time of processor P1 uh, is something like, is in the order of 4.4, while for processor P2 is 4.2. So it means that processor P2 is faster than P1. Again, recall that execution time, lower is better. Uh, and by how much, you just divide 4.4 by 4.2. And I don't exactly remember the number uh, from this, that this gives, this, this is 1.05 times. Um, so yeah, this is basically how you, you solve this. Uh, is there any question related to this? Okay, so in the performance evaluation question, this equation here is your best friend. So don't forget this equation. Um, okay, so last part of the question. Uh, so you say here that you want to improve the original uh, P1 design by including one, uh, uh, one new optimization without changing the clock frequency. You can choose one of the following optimizations. So ILU, so you're going to have an optimized ILU, which halves the latency of both arithmetic and uh, branch structure. So both arithmetic and branch instructions. Or LSU, uh, asymmetric load store unit, it halves the latency of load operations, but doubles the latency of store operations. So which optimization uh, should you add to processor P1 for application A, show you. So there are many ways to solve this question. So you can apply the execution, execution time formula here for the two optimizations and see which one would be best uh, by calculating the CPI again. And so this is one way, but I'm going to use another uh, equation uh, here that we learned in lecture 20, if I'm not mistaken. So which is Adam's law. So we have from Adam's law that uh, the speed up that you can get for, for optimizing something is going to be equals to one over one minus the, the enhanced fraction. So usually we call this one minus P. So P here is the portion that you are enhancing plus uh, the port uh, P, which is the, again, the push that you are enhancing and the speed up uh, that you are providing by uh, to the enhanced part. So again, and you can check lecture 20 for this equation over here. So we are going to apply this formula uh, to see which speed up uh, is larger. So uh, let me just copy from the previous, um, um, from the, the breakdown of instructions of application A, we had that we had uh, if I'm not mistaken, 40% of load instructions, 20% um, of store instructions, 30% of ILU structure, it's math instructions, and 10% of branches. Okay. So let's apply that formula over there. So this speed up, 
is going to be our first for the ILU optimization is going to be equals to one over one minus the portion that you are uh, enhancing. So uh, the new part, you are enhancing both arithmetic and branch instructions, right? So how much, uh, how many, uh, what is the portion of arithmetic and branch instructions that you have in the application, right? You have the 30% are arithmetic instructions, the 30% of our branch instructions. So it's going to be one minus 0.3. Uh, I'm going to simplify this. It's going to be minus 0 0.3, minus 0 0.1. Why again? This is coming from the fact that we have 30% arithmetic, 30% of branches. Plus the portion that you are going to speed up. So you're speed upping uh, 0 0.3 plus 0 0.1 uh, of your application divided by how much you are optimizing that part, right? By how much you are optimizing that part. So you are halving the latency, right? So you are optimizing the part by two times. So this is divided by two. So if you do this math here, this should give you 1.25 times. And then we do the same for the, for the LSU part. So one over, one minus. The portion that you are optimizing. So you are optimizing load and store instructions. So load instructions are 40%. And store instructions are 20%. Let me highlight this again. So this 0.4 is coming from here, and this 0.2 is coming from here. Plus the portion that you are optimizing, 0.4 plus 0.2. Oh, but there is a thing. There's a thing. So for this is an asymmetric optimization, right? So for the for the load operations, you're half in the latency, right? So load operations are 0 0.4 of the, uh, are 40% of the total that application, right? Or instruction that you have. So for those 40%, you're going to half the latency, meaning that you're optimizing by two times, right? The latency of uh, load operation. However, sorry, for store operations, which are, 0.20% of the total, so 0 0.2, uh, the latency increases by two times, it doubles. So this multiplies the latency by two. So you, you could also think of this second part here as if you wanna follow the same uh, procedure as before, if this is 0 0.42 and the latency, uh, is, is, is times this, right? Uh, one and a half is this thing. But anyway, so if you do the math over here, you're going to get one. So the question is, which optimization do you add to processor P1 for application A, right? So you want to add the optimization that gives you the most speed up. And the application, the optimization that gives you the most speed up is uh, the, the ILU optimization of value optimization things we give larger speed ups. So any question related to this? Again, you can, uh, if you don't remember this equation here from lecture 20, you can do the same with CPI. So you calculate the CPI for the uh, LU implementation, the new CPI, the new CPI for the same as we did in A and B here, uh, CPI for LSU implementation, and then you compare the two uh, CPIs. Um, but I want to you show how to do it, uh, use this other equation here, uh, which is actually, I guess is easier, is quicker to do. Um, so, okay, is any question? Um, 
Uh, hello, everyone. Let's take a look at question six, pipelining from uh, last year's exam. So first, let's try to read the question. Um, it gives us a simple MIPS uh, machine, which has five pipeline stages, as we discussed in the uh, lecture. So it has a fetch stage, where it fetches the instruction from the instruction memory, the decode stage, where it decodes what the instruction is, and also fetch the uh, register operands. In the third execute stage, it does the arithmetic operations and generate the memory addresses if it's in load and store instruction. And the fourth memory stage, uh, it will try to load from the memory if it's a, a load word instruction. Finally, in the write back stage, it writes the register, uh, it writes the result back into the register or like it stores into the memory if it's a store uh, instruction. Uh, given this basic uh, ISA, we are given two machines, A and B. So for machine A, um, it says it doesn't implement interlocking in hardware. So we, uh, as the compiler, will have to insert NOP instructions manually such that the data dependencies between the instructions are uh, respected. And it has internal register forwarding. Uh, in other words, um, if an instruction writes to an register, then another in, uh, in then another instruction can also get like this newly written register value in the uh, same cycle. Uh, finally, for the branch prediction, uh, it, pr it, it predicts all branches as always taken. Uh, and yeah, uh, the next program counter will be available after the second decode stage. And for machine B, um, the internal register for, uh, file forwarding and br branch prediction are, are all the same as machine A, but th th the difference is uh, machine B implements hardware interlocking with data dependence detection. Uh, this means that we will no longer need to manually insert knobs as uh, compilers. And uh, the hardware will like uh, store the uh, pipeline if it detects the data dependency. And it's worth noticing that um, the result of a load instruction can only be forwarded from the uh, write back stage. Um, then let's take a look at the code segment uh, that we'll analyze. So basically uh, like it executes in a loop so first it loads two values from the memory address stored in register four and uh, write them back into register one and two. Then it adds the value stored in register one and two and save it in register three. Then it stores the uh, value in register three back to the memory address indi indicated by register four. And then like it uh, subtracts the value in register four by an Im immediate value of uh, four. And uh, it continues to loop uh, if the value in register four is not zero. Um, and from like this uh, initial register values given, we can see that the loop will execute a hundred times. So then let's take a look at the first question. So it asks us to uh, rewrite the code segment with minimal changes and minimal latency such that uh, the code can execute correctly uh, with like all the data dependency handled. Um, I think it's uh, like this question A is the best to be solved uh, together with question B, where like it asks us to uh, like fill the table with the timeline of the execution of the first loop iteration of the code segment. So let's start with, uh, so let's start with like uh, drawing the timeline of the execution of the instructions in the first loop. So first we will ex execute this, we will execute this like load word in, in instruction. So we write this down, load word uh, from offset zero in register four. And yeah, this, doesn't have any dependency. So we can uh, execute all stages. 
Also for the second load instruction, it also doesn't have any dependency. So we can uh, execute this. Okay, now for the third instruction, as, as we can see, uh, it's two source operands register one and two, they uh, depend on the previous two load word instructions. And uh, by the third cycle, they are both not ready yet. So let's see when we'll, uh, uh, so let's see when we'll like the value in register one and two to, to ready. Um, it's like, at uh, like the sixth cycle. So be, uh, because the value for the instruction is fetched in the decode stage, this means that we will place the decode stage of this add instruction in cycle six. And if we put like a decode stage here in cycle six, then we see like, uh, like apart from the previous de uh, de uh, decode stage, like we have two empty cycles. So this means that we will have to insert two knobs here and the add uh, instruction goes here. So the decode stage is here and yeah, like these two bub, uh, knobs just, okay, then, then we know that, oops, sorry. Then we know that we will uh, have to put two knobs after the first two load word instructions. And yeah, we put the add instruction. So let's continue with the uh, rest of the program. Um, the, uh, the next store word in, uh, in, uh, in instruction, it also, its source operand also depends on the uh, result of the add instruction. So again, we, we will have to wait, uh, for the add instruction, uh, to have the results re ready in the write back stage. So same as, uh, same as before we are put, uh, like the decode stage of this stored word in instruction in cycle nine. And cycle nine is like two uh, cycles apart from like the previous decode stage. So again, we insert two knobs and put the store word instruction here. Yep. Then we also know we need to put two knobs here and the store word instruction. And then for the uh, subtraction, uh, we have no dependencies compared to uh, like the previous store word instruction. So this can be safely executed. And finally, for the branch uh, in instruction, it depends on the previous subtraction instruction. So yeah, again, we wait for two cycles. We insert two knobs and put the branch instruction here. Okay, uh, knob, knob. And put the, yeah, the label back. Okay, so we are done with question A and B. Um, let's take a look at question C. So it asks us, given the rewritten code segment, uh, yeah, please. Uh, 
Yeah, so I think um, so. Like th uh, this is a bit like ambiguous in defining like what is the first iteration. So you can put like a knob after that or not because ah uh, uh, oh, yeah, like you are referring to question A, right? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, so in fact, like the start of the second instruction, like it will happen uh, at like the second cycle after like the branch not equal zero in, uh, in instruction. But yeah, I think in this case, like, um, so yeah, like we have branch prediction here. So it says uh, it's, yeah, always taken. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I think we we should have a knob here, but because like this knob is is like always there, like regardless of what instruction it is, because like the branch prediction is implemented this way, it's always there. So yeah, because like it's specified that the uh, next program counter will be available after the decode stage. So there's always like a bubble uh, there. Yeah, I think in the case of this question as it's like, as the specification of the machine here, it is this case. So in this case, if the branch uh, if the branch predictor specification is written as this, I think it's like the case that, uh, or like mm, if you put a knob here, we understand like you know this, it should be okay. Yeah, yeah, that's very good uh, question. Thanks. Uh, please. Mm, no, because like uh, if we move this up, then for like the store word in instruction, it will like write to a different address. Then like you're changing the instructions, not reordering. Yeah, but like in, uh, yeah, yeah, like this kind of optimization is like legit. You can do that, but yeah, I think in like uh, in designing this question, we do not think that you can rewrite the. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah. It okay. Let me read the question again. Um, yeah, I think there's yeah. We should have written this question uh, better uh, because, like, first in the machine specification, in the data forwarding and interlocking part, it says like the compiler will order the instructions, not like rewrite them. Yeah, but you're right that in question A, we like we we put the word rewrite, so it might cause some confusion. We all like discuss this and yeah, maybe we will release a better version of the question and we will notify through Moodle. Yeah, but indeed, if you change the instructions the way you did by, moving the, sub, uh, the substruction up and also like change the offset uh, to the store word in instruction. Yeah, I think it can save some cycles. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, so uh, let's continue with like the assumptions that um, we do not change the instruction themselves and just like reorder them. 
and let's take a look at question C to calculate the number of cycles it, it takes to execute uh, the code segment on machine A. So we have our timeline uh, of the execution of the first iteration here. So as you can see, um, it takes uh, 13 cycles to finish the uh, one iteration because yeah, as talked before, the, uh, the first instruction of the second iteration will happen after the decode stage of this like branch instruction. So let's assume like the second iteration happens here. The fetch will be here. So it takes 13 instructions to perform uh, one iteration, uh, 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 sorry, it takes 13 cycles to perform one, one uh, iteration and we have like a total of 100 iterations. So it's 13 times 100. And at the end of the last iteration, we have to drain the pipeline. We have like three more cycles to go. So plus three equals 1300 and three cycles. Yep. Okay. And um, then for question D. So now we are, yes, please. Um, yeah, so like in the last uh, iteration, like we are at like cycle D, uh, like cycle 13, D, yes. Then we have like three more cycles. Okay, now for question D, we are executing the same code on machine B. So on um, machine B, uh, the result from the memory stage or the write back stage, they can be forwarded to the execute stage. And the result of a load instruction can only be forwarded from the write back stage. So it's important to notice that uh, in machine B, the result is forwarded to the ex execute stage, but not the decode stage. Um, so still, uh, let's draw the timeline for the first two in instructions. They don't have any dependencies. So we can execute. Uh, but for the third add instruction, one and two are dependent on the first two instructions. And since it says that like the result of a load instruction can only be forwarded from the write back stage to the execute stage. So we will, uh, we will want to put the execute stage of this add instruction here, the same cycle as the write back stage because of the forwarding and the internal register file forwarding that we can access the newly written data at the same cycle as, like, yeah, as it is written. So we can have the fetch, the decode, but yeah, we have to store the uh, pipeline for one cycle because we have to wait, uh, because the execute stage have to wait for the write back stage of like the second load instruction. And uh, then for the store word instruction, Sorry, this should be memory and write back. For the store word instruction, it's also dependent on the add uh, in instruction, but since it's an add, not a load word, the result can be forwarded from the memory stage. So we should have the, um, execute stage here, the memory stage and the write stage. Then for the subtraction, we don't have uh, dependencies. And for the branch instruction, oops, yeah. We have the dependency on register four, so it will also have to wait. Sorry, this we should also have a a bubble here. And yeah, this is getting a bit messy.
Okay. Um, so now for the uh, last question, we we want to calculate the number of cycles it takes to uh, execute the code segment on machine B. Um, Uh, wait a minute, um, let me check. Ah, uh, yeah, so yeah, this is like, yeah, sorry for like like this mess. Um, so for the su subtraction in uh in instruction, because like this fetch stage is stored, um, this fetch stage will, uh, yeah, let's just like move every column down. Uh, this fetch stage will happen here and decode, execute, memory, write back. So, oops. So this goes to here and this goes to, uh, yep. Yes. Okay. Um, to calculate the num number number of cycles, we, so we see like how long does every iteration take, and remember that we will still have to wait one more cycle for uh, the branch uh, PC to be resolved. So for the first instruction of the next iteration, it will happen here. So as we can see, it takes eight cycles for a iteration. So eight times a hundred plus uh, another three cycles to drain the pipeline at the end of the uh, execution of the program. So we have 803 cycles for the, the entire program. Yeah, so that's all for this uh, question. Is there any uh, question comments? Yeah, okay, and th thank you very much for the feedback. We will, yeah, the, discuss about this. Yeah, thanks. So we're gonna solve together the question on Thomas Sullo's algorithm. Um, this is a question that usually is in the exam every year, I think. Um, and it's mostly reading it in the beginning and paying attention to what, the, to what it says, the information that, they, that we give in the instructions. And then the question, I think if you understand the algorithm and what is the reservation stations, the execution units, et cetera, and the registers, the register naming, then you will be able to solve it quite easily because the questions after you read it are quite similar, I would say. So let's read together. So uh, it says in the beginning, we consider an in-order fetch out of order dispatch. The out of order dispatch is what makes it also the uh, Tomasulo's part of it, makes it the Tomasulo's algorithm and the out of order execution but we have in order retirement of the instructions. So the engine has four stages, the fetch, decode, execute, and write back. The engine can fetch one instruction per cycle, decode one instruction per cycle, and write back the result of one instruction per cycle. So we have the important, in this exercise is this information. We have another that executes add instructions and the multiplier, which executes multiplier instructions, multiplications. So this is really important. And don't be confused here. It's not the same thing as having um, reservation stations. It's different having the execution units, different having different number of uh, reservation stations. So I'm, I'm saying that so that you don't confuse during the exam. So the execution units are fully pipelined. The other has two stages, E1 and E2. And the multiplier has four stages, E1, E2, E3, and E4. And the execution of each state takes one cycle. 
The other has, this is the second most important information. The other has a two entry reservation station and the multiplier has a three entry reservation station. So when we want to execute um, add, add instructions and we'll have dependencies, then we will use the reservation stations to dispatch the instructions of the other. And we use the separate uh, reservation stations for the multiplier. This is critical to solve the exercise correctly. It says the, the instruction always allocates the first available entry of the reservation stations of the corresponding execution unit. This information is helpful, maybe not in this exercise specifically, but it's helpful if you need to find out the order of the dependencies or some order of the instructions, because this is how you will understand the, the registry naming inside the reservation stations and how the instructions were uh, adding up entries in the reservation stations. So the next information, full data forwarding is available. During the last cycle of the execution stage, the tax and data are broadcast to the reservation station, the register alias table. So to remind you, the register alias table gives us information about the dependent instructions, the dependent registers from the reservation stations. It says here, the uh, an add instruction updates the reservation station entries of the dependent instructions in the E2 stage. So the updated value can be read from the reservation station entry in the next cycle. Therefore, a dependent instruction can potentially begin execution in the next cycle. This is not important for the exercise. You just need to keep uh, in mind that the register alias table will give us the dependencies with the reservation station entries. So the multiplier and other have separate output buses, which allow both the other and the multiplier to update the reservation stations in the RAT in the same cycle. And the last property, an instruction continues to occupy a reservation station, a reservation station slot until it finishes the write back stage. And the reservation station entry is deallocated after the write back stage. So let's go right now to the problem definition. This was the system configuration, right? So the processor is about to, to uh, fetch and execute five instructions. So read this carefully because some student at some point thought it would execute seven. And I remember correcting this. So uh, assume the reservation stations are initially all empty and the initial state of the register alias table is given below in figure A. So what we see here, we see that all the registers are valid and all the registers have some value, right? And you need to be careful about the values because this is how you need to reverse engineer in the following question that I will show. So instructions are fetched, decoded and executed as discussed in class. And at some point during the execution of the five instructions, you see a snapshot of the state of the state of the reservation stations and the register alias table, uh, which is B and C. So as you can see right now in B, we have some registers which are not valid. And why are they not valid? Because they're waiting for some, uh, they have a dependency. We need to execute first some instruction and then update the registers. And as you can see in the tag, we see the registers and uh, we see the dependencies coming from the reservation stations. For example, register four is invalid and its value depends on the execution of A in the multiplication reservation station number entry uh, entry number two. Okay, this is really important to understand. So spend the first minutes to understand if there is a similar question to understand uh, the information given in, in these uh, figures, like the initial state of the reservation uh, of the register alias table, the final state of the re register alias table and the intermediate the snapshot of the reservation stations to be able to understand what's going on. So as you can see also the, yeah, uh, okay. Okay, we can start with the question. So what it says in the beginning, let's say we need to create a data flow graph. So. Based on the information provided above, identify the instructions and provide the data flow graph below for the instructions that have been fetched. Please appropriately connect the nodes using edges and specify the direction of its edge. Label its edge with a destination architectural register and the corresponding tag. So 
to begin with, the way you would start thinking about this is we need to think as we have some inputs, the, so the registers which are used in the beginning, we have some operators, pluses and multiplications on this stage in time. So we have, in the beginning, we have all the registers, right? All the registers which are uh, valid. So as you can see here, we had some registers which are valid, which is register 0, 1, 2, 3, 6, 7. Let me make it with the red. It's 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 6, and 7. For sure, you're going to need these for the inputs, right? We need to start with these registers because all the other registers have dependencies. So what I would do if I were you, I would start with R0, R1, R2, R3, R6, and R7. Okay, so how do we start? We need to figure out first that you need to simplify it as much as possible. So start by the what you consider obvious. So if we go back and see here in the plus, the reservation station for the others, right? You can see that we have two ready registers which need to be added together, right? And they produce the, the renamed value L. So which are the values of these two registers? The first register has the value 82 and the second register has the value one. So then you need to go back to the initial state of the rat and ask yourself, so which, to which registers these values correspond to? So we have register R1, which has the value 82 and the register R2, which has the value one, okay? And then you go and ask, okay, and which uh, register is L going to update? So L is going to update register R8, right? So you start simply like this, and then you need to do the following. So we need to combine R1 and R2 to produce the result for R8. So the way you would do it is this, R1, R2. What operation are we doing? We're doing an addition, right? And what do we produce? We produce the result for R8. And how do you show this? You show that we produce the symbol L, which corresponds to the output for R8. So this is the, the simplest, I think, we have in this exercise. And then you need to track and understand the most complicated, the more complicated dependencies. So let's go back. So let's try to see if we see anything else familiar. So for F, what do we see? So for F, we see that we have two valid registers, a register with the value 45 and the register with the value one. So which register has the value 45 in the question? So the register with, the, yeah. You can say, you can say. Yeah. And which is this operation? Correct. So, uh, as your colleague said, we have um, an operation for to, that updated register R3, which is done before the snapshot. And we added uh, R4 uh, and R7 because this is the only combination that can produce the result 45. So the only register that has changed is R3. And this is the first operation that we need to point out to be able to continue with the uh, rest of the dependencies. So we have R4 as well, which is coming from a previous snapshot, this R4. This is not the final R4, right? And 
we want to perform a plus operation between R4 and R7. Again, I repeat, R4 in the initial state has a value 10 and R7 has a value 35, which ends up, ends up being 45. So the symbolic name here is not shown because the instruction is already executed. You can name it, let's say X, whatever. And we update the register R3. So this R3 is really important right now because it's gonna, it's not, it's gonna be needed uh, to identify the rest of the dependencies. So let's go back. So let's find the F, right? Which register is this one? This is R3. And which register is this one? This is register R2. So we know that F is gonna be produced by multiplying registers R3 and R2. So we can show this here. The, the new R3, right? So we have We need to multiply the result that we received from the addition of R7 and R4, which is the content of R3, with and combine it and multiply it with the content of R2, which is one. And this way, what do we produce? We produce F. And where is F, uh, which values, which register is F going to update? It's going to update R5, right? F is going to update R5. So the output is the symbolic name F, which updates the register R5. So let's try to go for the next dependence. So we have A and B, right? So for uh, A, for A, what do we see? We depend on the tag F and on 10. So the tag F, was produced is, the, is right now the uh, the content of the value of the register R5, right? So it's the value that will be produced here. And 10, as you can see, 10 is again the value of R4 because that register hasn't changed. So we need to multiply 10 by, which is, we can, you can write it here as well if you want to remember it. It's fine writing the values. Just point out that it's a value, right? Um, which is multiplied by the content of R5 from the symbolic name F. And what do we output? We output A. And where is A? What is A updating? It's update R4 itself. So you need to point out here the label A with R4. So we have only one that is not defined yet. So we have B, one valid register with the content 23, and another valid register with the content 45. So with the content 45, we already know that it's the register 3. And with the content 23, it's a register six, as you can see here. So what we can do is we need to come here and say, the R6 needs to be combined with, be careful here, it's this one, it's the output of, it's X here, the R3. It needs to be multiplied in order to produce B, which you can see here B is uh, gonna update the register R9. So here R9, yes. So this is the, I think it's quite simple, this one. Uh, sometimes it's more complicated, sometimes it's more simple. Any questions on that? Because then the 
Next one depends. It's easy. It depends only on that. Just be careful with the with the nodes, and try to understand well the the transitions between the register alias tables and the contents of the reservation stations. Spend more time understanding it rather than starting the the schematic and the data flow quickly. Okay. We can go to the second question. So we need to fill in the blanks below with the five instruction sequence in program order. And there can be more than one correct ordering. When referring to registers, please use the their architectural names are zero through R9 and place the register with a smaller architectural name on the left uh, source register box. So be careful here, do not write values instead of registers unless you need to. Like you need, because we do not have immediates here, you don't have an add immediate, we have an add between registers. So do not start writing add to R8, 10, 25. Like that, that doesn't make sense in the ISA. We need to add registers, not values. So what is the first instruction that we needed to execute? The first instruction was, as we saw, as we did in the beginning, was the R7 with R4, which adds to R3. There is one more instruction that we can, okay, let's let's put it in another context. So which instruction needs can be executed at any point in time? That doesn't matter. The instruction is, we add, yes, you can see. Yeah, so R1 and R2, which add up to R8, it can be executed at any point in time. Yeah. Yes, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Or not? I mean, um, after the ad, after the first ad, not. It cannot be before the first ad, right? It needs to be after the first addition to the R three, R four. So the first one, yes, it's the ad. As we said, it's the ad to R three, which was executed before the snapshot. We add R4 and R7 and we add it to R3. So what we did next is we multiplied the content of R3 with the content of R4 to produce the value of, um, no, actually, no, we didn't do that. We multiplied the content of R2 and the content of R3 to produce R5. So we need to multiply the content of R3 and the content of R2. So here, the order between the registers is fine. Like you can put it, if you do a mistake, we're not gonna uh, cut any grade, any points. Like it, it's fine because it's the same operation essentially, right? Even though in the, re in the reservation stations, there is an order, even if you don't write it correctly, like I'm not gonna uh, cut any points. So, and we update register R5. And then what did we did is we took the value of R4, we multiplied it with the R5. So we, we put it to R4, we multiply R5 with R4. So here, so as I said, the, this, this one, it can be anywhere, right? After the first one though, after the first one. So it needs to be either here, 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 or here. So I would add it at the end, it's more safe. Uh, so I would add it at the end. And then we have one more multiplication to produce R9, which is using um, R3. So be careful about that. Uh, it needs to be after the first instruction. So R9 is using R6 and the result from the first addition. That produced R3. So this is the execution uh, of the program. 
Any questions? I think if you understand the data flow graph, if you would understand the data flow graph in this exercise, you would be easily uh, writing down the, the program. Yeah, the goal here is to test whether you can uh, understand the concept of reservation stations and the register alliance table of the, of the Thomas Ullus algorithm. Okay. Thanks. Uh, this question is about GPU and SIMD, uh, mostly about to calculate the SIMD utilization rate. So, uh, so in this question, we have a GPU that the warp size we consider it has, uh, t you know, uh, 32 threads here. And we have uh, 32 SIMD lanes. So it means that a warp can, can be executed in one cycle completely. So we have uh, two codes here, and there are some questions regarding uh, each code that we are going over, going, uh, over them. So the, the important thing about uh, this code segment is that, uh, so the, the, the instruction inside the first, the outer loop, each of them is only one instruction. So basically we don't, uh, we assume that those, uh, for example, addition instruction like array i plus uh, equal to array i plus one. So it's kind of, uh, you consider that, you know, the values are ready in your registers. You don't need to load them from the memory. So basically they are only one instruction. So we have basically four instructions inside the, uh, the outer loop. And uh, each iteration is assigned to one thread. So this is the basic explanation of this uh, question. So the first question is that, how many warps does it take to execute uh, those code segments? So basically it is the, actually the, the easiest uh, part of this question. So we have, uh, so each four has uh, 1,024 iterations and we assigned each iteration to one thread. So basically the total number of threads that you need is uh, 1,024. And uh, the warp size is 32. So basically the number of warps that we need divided by 32, which is 32 warps. Is it clear? I think so, yeah. So the second part is about, as I said, SIMD utilization. So it's asking that what is the SIMD utilization of the first iteration of the inner loop, which means uh, J equals to zero for code segment one. So let's take another look at this code segment. So in this code, uh, we initialize the S to one. Here we have a condition. So whenever you have a condition, you should think about it. If all threads in, in a warp are going to execute, are going to take that branch or some of them are going to be not taken. So if all threads of a warp basically take the branch, we have like 100% utilization for that warp. And if none of, I mean, non threads, no threads in that warp basically take that branch, then we don't need to schedule that warp for the execution. So again, we don't waste our CMD lanes. So the, the inefficient part is that some threads in a warp take the branch and some of them basically uh, do not take the branch. So then we have some you know, loss in our uh, utilization. So here uh, the branch is checking the, if uh, I, you know, the, the mode of uh, two multiplied by S is basically uh, equals to zero or not. It, yeah, divisible or not. So, for the first iteration that J equals to zero, 
basically s is one. Then here we only check that i is even or odd, which means if the if our thread is if is in you know the, the, the thread id is even, we are uh, we take this branch, and if the thread id is odd, we don't take this branch. Okay. So in order to calculate the SIMD utilization, you should have a, you should first see basically how many instructions at the best case, you know, I mean, at the best case, I mean, if everything uh, goes smoothly with no branch uh, needs to calculate this instruction. So here we have like 32 warps based on the previous part. And each warp has 32 threads. And in this for loop, we have four instructions. So this is the, you know, the total number of instructions that could be executed in an efficient way. But for each warp, because in each warp, like 16 threads are even and 16 of them are odd. So we can say that basically in each warp, like the 32 warp, the 16 threads execute four instruction. But the other threads basically they execute three instructions. Those that do not take this branch, they just need to execute the, the last instruction. So if you simplify this equation, you reach to seven over eight. Is that clear? So 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 no no actually it is seven uh, over eight because I consider the first iteration j equals to zero because when it when j is zero basically s is one for every i exactly because basically in the explanation say that j is a uh, is stored in registers and is local for each thread. Mm. Yeah. No, 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 not J, S. S resides in a register and is private to each thread. No, 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 no. No, no, this is, uh, this S equals to one is kind of uh, initialization before launching our GPU kernel, let's say. So we initialize S to one, and we make a kernel that has like like a grid that has a uh, you know uh, 1024 threads and we just invoke that kernel and in the kernel code we have only these four instructions and it is important basically when you want to calculate the simd utilization you just need to consider the kernel code it's not important the initialization was in the cpu side not in the gpu Uh-huh. So I basically is a trade ID. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Exactly. For each trade. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Exactly, exactly. No, 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 no. So basically, 
in GPU, threads are running in parallel or yes, in parallel, you see. So each thread execute in serial. So you can, so I mean, these four instructions are executed in, you know, in a serial manner for each thread, but threads are, you know, are executing in parallel or concurrently, let's say. It's not visible. And actually it is in the, uh, based on the explanation of this uh, question, S resides in a register and is private to each thread. So basically each thread has its own version of S. The only shared, um, yeah, the only shared memory is the array A, which actually we don't care here because we say that we move array A to the registers. And the question is specifically said that the code segment are correct. So do not think about any correctness issues and those stuff. So you don't need to be worried about that. Any other questions? Yeah, sure. So in part C, we have the same question as part B, but for the code segment two. So let's take a look at code segment two. Again, we are going to calculate the SIMD utilization for the first iteration of the inner loop, which means J equals to zero. So here in, in code segment two, we initialize S to 512. And in the conditional branch, we, you know, the condition that we check is that I is less than S. Okay. So the number of I, which is the trade ID could be from zero to uh, 1023, which means that for those threads that their ID is less than 512, all of them are going to take this branch. And for those threads that their ID is uh, from 112 to uh, 1023, none of them is, are going to basically take this branch. So based on my explanation, you can, I guess you can assume that the SIMD utilization rate here is 100%. Because for the first 16 warps, so for the first 16 warps, why I'm saying 16? Because 16 times 32 is 512. So the, for the first 16 warps, all, all of the threads inside the warp are, they are going to basically take this branch. So you have, so all of them execute four instructions. And for the next 16 warps, again, all of them are going to execute three instructions. So we don't have any you know, waste in our CMD utilization. So if you want to write it down here, you can say that, okay, I have like 16 warps. Each of them has 32 threads and they run four instructions. And again, we have 16 warps, 32 threads, and they run three instructions. And here also, basically you need to repeat the same. So which means 100 person. So for this part, basically you don't, you don't need to write a, an equation, just, you know, write and your intuition about why it is 100% is, would be, you know, enough. Yeah. Exactly. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the difference is that in the second code, in, in code segment two, there is no warp that at, at least for uh, S equals to 512, there is no warp that have some threads are active and some of them are inactive. So this is the main difference. As I said, whenever you have a warp, you prefer to basically schedule all of all threads of that warp for the execution, or basically you do not schedule. So that means that you don't you you use your SIMD lanes completely, or you do not use them again completely. But whenever you have like some of threads active and some of them inactive inside one warp, then you have to schedule that warp, and you are using that SIMD lane uh, like partially, which wastes your uh, resources. Yeah, I'm not sure if I get your uh, got your question correctly. Uh huh. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, where the instruction for the differentiate the limitations by pushing it to say so you can actually use the full instruction for the full instruction. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's still. Um, yeah, it's still, I'm not sure if I understand your question. I will around, we can also uh, chat later. Um, okay. So in part D, yeah, it's like, I would say it's the hardest part of this question. He said that uh, it's, it's asking what's the same utilization of any iteration of the inner loop. So basically J can be from one, uh, can be from zero to 10 to basically to nine. So you should uh, come up with an equation that that equation should tell you what's, you know, the, the same utilization. Okay, let's see. So here we, in each iteration, we basically uh, shift, shift, shift left uh, S by one, which means that we multiply it by two. So here, so this condition first checks that if I is divisible by two, in the second iteration checks that if it, if it is divisible by four, eight, 16, 32, so until 32, you can see that basically the, uh, the trade ID, you know, of the of all warps, you can consider that them from zero to 31. 
So until 32, you can imagine that all warps, they have, they have at least one threat, one active threat. But when it is goes to 64, then we have some warps that they have only one active threat and some warps that they, that they don't have any active threat for that slot. So I'm telling you this because it can help you how to, uh, how to define that equation. Actually, this is uh, you know from the from the hint, which may be his voice. Okay, so let's write something here to solve it. So when j is zero, we are checking. And S is one. When J is one, then S is two. So you can come up with the equation like this is like two power of J plus one. And when J is nine, Basically, it is so the if equation checks if it is divisible by 1024 when j is 9. Okay. So until j equals to 4, here. It is two power five, which is 32. So let's write the equation. So until this part, we have this like, so we have 32 warp. Each warp has 32 thread, and each of them sh should run four instructions. Why I'm saying that they should run four instructions? Because all of these warps, there should be at least one thread that they that, that thread basically takes that branch. So we have a warp, we check the if, some threads, which at least one of them takes, takes that branch. So we have basically that warp is executing four instructions. So this four comes here because of that. And here in the top, we say that we have 32 warp. Then we should write the number of threads that they like they uh, take uh, four instructions. How many threads we have? 32 threads divided by Do I agree? So it means that it means that if J is uh, like, for example, when J is zero, we were checking that if it is divisible by two or not. So like 16 threads, they would take the branch. So here we calculate like 32 by uh, two power J plus one, which is like 32 by over two, which is 16, okay. And all of, the, all of these uh, threads, they take four instructions. The remaining threads, which is like 32 warps times one minus times three. These, the remaining threads, they take like three instructions. So if you just simplify this, uh, this equation, you don't need actually to simplify it a lot, but yeah, maybe you can 
yeah, for example, we can cancel out uh, 32, uh, 32. So here we have four over, and we have plus three minus, Then we reach to so if we, for example, for the uh, for part B that J was zero. If we consider J equals to zero, we we have one over two plus three over four, which is again uh, seven over eight that we had in part B. So this equation is correct for basically J greater or equal zero and less than five. Are there any questions for the first part of this part? <laughs> yes. Uh, sorry. Yeah, because exactly. So when, because when J is five, then, uh, in the in the in the condition you are checking that if i is divisible by 64 for example then it means that basically there should be some warps that they don't no trace of that warp is going to take that branch is that true so when when it is 64 it means that the first thread of the first warp is going to take the branch. Then uh, the second warp, no threads. The third warp, again, the first thread is going to take that branch. So because of that, we need to basically, um, yeah, we need to uh, you know, separate these two equations. So when J is uh, greater than, five and less than 10. The difference is that uh, there should be only one thread in some warps that, that is active. And there should be some warps that they don't have any active threads. And the number of that warps basically is divided by two by each iterations. So let's see. So for this part, so you have like, the total number of warps is 32 divided by, so when J is five, how many, warps do we have? Like how many active warps do we have to run that four instructions is uh, 16, basically. So for five is uh, 16, which means that we need to divide 32 by two. So here it means that I would say nine minus J. So this is the number of warps times 32 thread times four instructions. So here, the uh, other warps, they have like, again, 32 threads, but they execute only three instructions. And here we have, again, we have like 32 divided by
only one thread, execute four instructions. Other threads, which is 31, they execute three instructions in those works. And again, we have the same equation like here. Is the equation clear? Yeah, it could be a bit uh, confusing, but I hope you get the whole idea about how to write this equation. So, Yeah, I'm not going to simplify this equation. You don't need actually to simplify it a lot in the exam. If your equation makes sense, then that's all. You don't need to basically uh, solve it until the end. Okay. So the part E is asking again the same question for code segment two. So remember the difference between code segment two and code segment one. For code segment two, uh, so we have this S, we basically initialize it to 512. And in each iteration, we divide S by one, by two. So until, so let's keep the track. When J is zero, S is 512, which is 2, 9. When Gen is, J is 1, S is 256, which is 2, 8. And when J is 9, it should be 1. So we can come up with this equation, two, nine minus J. Okay. So, for this branch, for this if condition, remember we were saying that like, there are some warps that they, you know, they don't have any threads to take this branch. So if until S equals to 32, we have this uh, condition because like for, for example, for 64, again, we have like two warps that they completely, all of all threads of those warps are going to be executed. And for other warps, because they basically their thread ID is greater than S, no, none of threads of them are going to be executed. So it means that until, uh, if S32, which means that until J equals to four. So for J equals to zero, J equals to one and four, for all of them, we have 100% utilization rate. But starting from J5, when J is five, then S is like 16. Then there should be the first warp has some threads that are going to take this branch and some trades that are not going to take the branch. So basically our utilization rate starts decreasing from 
j equals to 5. So what you should say here is that like we have 100% utilization rate for j greater than greater or equal uh, of zero and less than five. And for that part, let's write an equation again. So for that part, you have one warp Yeah, exactly. So you have one warp that has uh, 32 threads, like one warp times 32, that it needs basically all of the, all of these threads, they need to run four instructions, but unfortunately they don't, some of them because of the, the EF operation. And the other warps, like the 31 warps, they have 32 threads and all of them, they execute three instructions. Okay, this is the, the bottom and in the, uh, in the top. So one warp, it has like 32 threads divided by Again, nine minus J times four plus that warp remaining threads of that warp they have three instructions and other warps. they have three instructions. So if you write this equation, then basically you answer this part again. Does it make sense? Okay. So in part F we have, is there any iteration where both code segments have the same utilization. So it is actually, uh, I would say a bit obvious. Like, so for, the, for this uh, part E, until J4, the utilization is 100%. And after uh, like when you, increase the J from four to nine. So you have less um, utilization rate. For part D, your, uh, basically uh, your utilization rate cannot be 100% in any case. So the answer should be in the second part for sure. Like J should be greater or equal five and less than 10 for sure. And if you check uh, these two equation, this equation and this equation, you can see that if I put uh, J as nine, basically both of them are completely the same. Are they? <laughs> yeah, I think so. If you simplify them, they are completely the same. So, uh, so the part F, J should be nine. Do you want me to simplify to make sure? I don't think so, okay. And part G, which code is expected to run faster on a GPU? So the one that has, um, usually the code that has less branch, that has a higher uh, SIMD utilization, should be run faster because whenever you have a higher utilization rate, it means that 
you are scheduling warps more efficiently. So the total number of warp instructions that you are executing is less. So I'm not saying that it is always the case. There should be some, because you always can like, yeah, exactly. If the workload is completely the same. So these two code, they are actually doing uh, the same thing. If you check them, the code segment one and code segment two, both of them are, are doing the same. The difference is that how you are accumulating, you know, the array A. So the overall, uh, the difference is how, uh, basically uh, how you organize your uh, memory accesses. So for this code, for this uh, specific example, because code segment two uh, has higher SIMD utilization than code segment one, except the last iteration, which is J9. Uh, so we expect that code segment two runs faster. Was that clear? Any question? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually, yeah, we had this uh, similar question, I guess. So the thing is that uh, S is private to each thread. So each thread has its own version of S. So basically, you know, all threads, they see like S, when they start executing, they see S equals to one. So, yeah, is that clear now? Yeah, the thread itself changes, yes. Oh, that's that even I said was only for the first iteration. I said that, yeah, for the first iteration of the inner loop, which was the, the question part B, J equals to zero. So for that, yeah, only even no, threads are going to take the branch, yeah. Sure. So I would suggest that you go over this question. We have a similar kind of this GPU SIMD question in, in the past exams. I would, I would say that this one was the, the hardest one. <laughs> so if, I, if you can completely understand this uh, question, I think uh, you should be able to solve any this kind of questions. Let's start with this question. Branch prediction, you're given the following piece of code that iterates through two large arrays, uh, J and K, and each are populated with completely, meaning truly random positive integers. The code has five branches labeled from B1 to B5. And when we say that a branch is taken, we mean that the code inside the curly brackets is executed. And assume that the code is run to completion without any errors or interruptions, there are no exceptions. Basically, it means that the code just runs smoothly and it finishes. So for the following questions, assume that uh, this is the only block of code that will ever be run on the machines and that the loop condition branches is resolved first in the iteration, uh, which means that the if statements execute only after resolving the loop condition branch. So this is the loop, right? It means that uh, we will first know if we need to uh, we resolve the condition here, and then we go to these these guys. So, um, and these are the branches. So let's uh, take a look. So it's a for statement. So the for loop, sorry, and that's a 
first if, second one, third and fourth, right? So you're given three machines whose components are identical in every way, except for their branch predictors. So machine A uses an always taken branch predictor, which is like a very simple always taken over and over. Machine B uses one single level global two-bit saturating counter branch predictor shared by all branches, which starts at weekly taken. And machine C uses a pair branch two-bit saturating counter uh, as its branch predictor. And now all counters start at weekly not taken. And here's the saturating counter values. So you have a strongly not taken. So for our solution, let's call it S and T. And then weekly not taken, WNT, and weekly taken, WT, and strongly taken, okay? So basically it means that if you are weekly not taken, but then it turns out that you have to actually take the branch, then you first go to weekly taken. Um, and then if again, you realize that, oh, you actually need to take the branch for the next one, you go strongly taken. So you gradually update your confidence and prediction. So uh, let's see what the questions are. So it says that, good, answer the following questions. So it basically for all of them, ask for misprediction rate when the above pieces of uh, piece of code uh, runs on machine A, B, and C. So uh, we need to figure that out. And for A and C, it's like very easy, right? It always does one thing or in, this is like a local one. And for B is the one which is a little bit more detailed uh, because it's a global history. So we need to see what's the interaction between different branches and stuff. So let's just start with A. What was A? I was like, okay, always uh, taken. So let's, let me quickly, uh -huh, yeah, I can actually do this. So we see both things, for example. Ah, oh, that, that actually looks good. Okay. So we want to be always taken. Let's see what happens. So for this branch B1, um, always taken is fine all the time, except for the last iteration. So when we go to I1000, then it's like, uh, it mispredicts, right? So B1 leads to one misprediction out of uh, 1,001 times that it executes. Right. So then B2, B2 gets executed. So B2, B3, B4, B5 get executed only a thousand times because in the end for the thousand and first uh, branch, which is like I equal to 1000, it would not go in here anyways. So it would have only a thousand times uh, these guys would execute. And so it's always taken. So it's even an odd. So 500 times uh, would uh, do mistakes. And then for here, the 250 first times it's fine. And then starts mispredicting the remaining 750 times. And for B4 and B5, so it's like this one is like less than 500 and the other one is like bigger or equal to that. So we would have each of them 500 times mispredicting. So overall your, um, misprediction rate uh, would be something like this. So uh, all of these guys, so if I wanna cheat, the number is this. So you can just, just sum them, that doesn't matter, right? Uh, you can write the sum here. And then here uh, we would have 5,000, like overall 1,000 for each of them. And for this one also one extra for I equal to 1,000. So we would have this, that will go, overall counter branches, and that will be our misprediction rate. So let's go to a machine B, which has, um, I don't know, like a more complex predictor. So we wanna have a single level global two-bit saturating counter, starting at weekly taken. So this solution I want to, since I wanna explain it a bit more, I wanna write it in the back of the paper. Um, so it's a global one, right? So here we have part B, which is global and starts at weekly taken. 
So what would that mean? Uh, so it is global, meaning that all branches together would lead to something like they would change the history together, all of them. So let's take a look at them based on different values of I, right? We would uh, expect to see kind of like uh, same sort of trends for I, less, uh, I, let's say, between zero to 249, right? Because then this branch starts like acting differently. Enter it a bit more. Yeah. This one starts like acting a bit differently, right? So let's separate this. So I want to first solve it for that. Then I will solve it for 250 until like 499. And then I will solve it for 500 until 1000. So let's see. Let's just like uh, start playing with it around and let's see what happens. And we will see some patterns and that would help us a bit. So I start with I0. And I'm weakly taken. I go to branch one, which actually turns out to be taken. So I go strongly taken. Then B2, which is like this even an odd thing. I'm even. So great, strongly taken. B3, it's like less than 250. That's right. And then B4, less than 500. Uh, that's right, right, so I'm strongly taken. And then B5, it's like, okay, no, that's like, that's different. So we go to weekly taken. Because from strongly taken, you first go to weekly taken. Uh, you don't, you can like change gradually, right? So that was iteration zero. And then at the end of it, I'm weekly taken. I wanna go to uh, iteration one. Let's see what happens here, right? So this is this weekly taken here, here comes here. So B1, great, still strongly taken. Uh, B2, no, this is an odd number. So we go weekly taken. That was a wrong prediction, let's say. Then we have B3, uh, says that, okay, let's sign 450, that's right. And then B4, let's sign 500, that's right. B5 again, weekly taken. So when I go to iteration two, I will be weekly taken again, right? So, so the pattern would kind of like repeat because always, you know, I would start either odd or even, I would start with weekly taken and then I would do the same stuff. Uh, so let's see in this uh, scenario, how many misses we had. Uh, we're doing fine here, except for this one, right? Then let's see what happens here. Here was a misprediction, and then here also, right? So this whole combination, let's say this duo happens overall one uh, twenty five times, right? And overall, we would have three misses per duo per like these two lines. So it would be three seventy five misses so far. Uh, okay. This color, yeah, okay, it shows color also. Okay, let's go to I equals to 250 until 249. Oh, sorry, no, 449, right? That's uh, before 500. 449, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was like an elementary school mistake. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, let's start. So, I250. We start with I250 here. We weekly taken, right? So, we start with weekly taken. And we go to B1. Um, okay, it's uh, strongly taken because it's this branch, right? And then B2, what happens is that, okay, strongly taken. And then B3 uh, no longer holds, right? So it would be weakly taken. Then B4, 
before what happens is like, okay, less than 500, yeah, that's still correct, strongly taken. And then B5, we would be, uh, in this case, um, weekly taken, right? So did we do that correctly? Let's uh, quickly take a look. Um, so we had weekly taken, then we were strongly taken, then B2 was strongly taken, then uh, we went to be uh, weekly taken here, right? Because we're no longer send this. And then strongly taken, and then weekly taken. Seems fine. Okay, let's go to I251. And let's see what happens. So we start again with weekly taken, relatively happy. Uh, so here, B1, again, strongly taken. B2, uh, it's an even odd, right? They're even, so mis we mispredict, we go, we go weekly taken. And then B3, what was B3? It's like, okay, less than this, no, uh, it's wrong. So we go weekly not taken because we can like gradually reduce our confidence, right? And then B4, uh, as I go less than 500, that's correct. So let's be weekly uh, taken again. We cannot go to taken. And then B5, uh, we mispredict because we're like less than 500, right? So we go to weekly not taken. So here's the catch. Uh, we do not repeat the pattern again with 250 because 250 happened to start with weekly taken. But then now 252 is gonna start with weekly not taken. So we can't rely on 250 to make our decisions, right? So unfortunately we need to continue with 252 again to see if a pattern would emerge. Uh, okay, so weekly not taken, B1, right? What do we do here? Uh, so weekly, not taken, B1, so we go to be weekly taken. Then B2, we become strongly taken because it's an even number. And then B3, what was B3? Less than this one, no, weekly taken. B4, less than this one. Wait, is it, are we correct right now? So this one is a weekly taken, right? And then B2, uh, strongly taken, correct? B3, uh a weekly taken because it's like a mistake here right and then 200 and then less than 500 yes we are less than 500 is strongly taken and then b5 uh again we mispredict because we are less than 500 and then we go to weekly taken and unfortunately the pattern emerges right because here we are weekly taken and then we also started with weekly taken for odd numbers so it seems like, okay, from now on, this duo is just going to repeat, okay? So let's see which thing is mispredicted. So this was good, let's try this one mispredicted, right? So from strongly to went to weekly, and this, right? Then here, this was fine, here was mispredicted. Then again, we mispredicted from weekly taken and went to not taken. And then here from not taken, we went to taken, right? And then here from weekly taken to not taken. So we did a horrible job here in terms of mispredicting. Uh, let's see what happens. So here we saw this guy is not taken, but it was taken. And this one, we thought it's strongly taken, but it was not, so we went to weekly, right? Uh, and this, okay. So uh, what happens is that we have like, if we had this like good duos, we would be like, again, uh, 125 multiplied by seven, but then one of them, instead of having three, like one of these even ones or I even ones has, instead of being three has two. So let's remove one, right? Because otherwise it would not uh, be the same here. So. I'm gonna cheat here, 874. Sounds good, right? Mm. 
Okay. So let's do I-500, 2,000, right? And let's be aware of the fact that for I-1,000, we only do B1, we don't do other Bs. So let's see what, what's up here. Uh, oh, we do. Okay. I'm not going to show the solution sheet right now. I assume that after all these, you can like remember what each branch represents until probably next week. So uh, let's just start with I equals to 500. So I equals to 500 is an even iteration, even I, right? And then the even ones start with weekly not taken. So let's just start. So we start with weekly not taken. Let's see what happens. So B1, this is the one that is like almost all the time is like taken. So we, we, we go weekly taken. And then we have B2, even odd thing, right? So strongly taken. And that is B3 is like, is it less than 250? No, weekly taken. Is it less than 500? No, will we weekly not taken? But then finally, after all this time, is it less than 500 or like equal to 500? Yes. So it will be weekly taken. So we start this one with I equals to 501 with uh, weekly taken, right? So B1, weekly taken. Oh, sorry. It will be strongly taken, right? And then B2, weekly taken because uh, that's an odd number. Then B3 uh, would be weekly not taken. It's the one that less than 250. Then B4, okay. Uh, strongly not taken. And then B5 uh, is a taken branch, right? Because it's like more than 500. So we, be, we go weekly not taken, which is good. Like finally the pattern again emerges because we again start the even iterations with weekly not taken. So we're kind of happy about it uh, right now, finished. And then for uh, iteration thousand, which is like the, spe the special one, which only like B1 uh, gets checked. Again, we start with weekly not taken, which is actually the branch we don't want to take. So again, we're happy about it. So, Let's see what happens here. How many times did we mispredict? Uh, okay, this one we mispredicted. Weekly taken, this one. And then weekly taken, we went to not taken this one. Then it was not taken, but it was taken here. Okay, so here, this was fine. This was not fine. This was not. Weekly not taken, we were strongly, the school, the seven, okay? So here we have overall, uh, uh, 250 of these duos happen multiplied by seven and that would give us uh, 175, right? So let's uh, add these guys. Hmm. Middle one, this one? Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Six. Right, so it will be the same, right? 124 multiplied by seven plus six is equal to this, right? Yeah, that's fine. So when you magically add these numbers or like you can just also add them without adding them if you have the uh, addition, like time problems, but anyways. So that will be our misprediction. Uh, yeah. Uh, good news is part C is like orders of magnitude takes less work than this one. So is there any question about this before we move on? No. Okay, part C. Uh, 
It's very good. So let's see what was the question. So machine C uses per branch. Uh, predictor starts at weekly not taken. So if it's per branch, it's good, right? Our life is going to be like simpler. Let me. And we're going to start at weekly not taken. And this time we don't need to go through interactions of all stuff. So we're going to start with weekly not taken, which is, um, so we, we will take this branch, right? So not taken mispredicts it for the very first one. For i equals to zero, we mispredict because we actually take the branch. And then like, we start like taking the branch forever. And this becomes a strongly taken until the last one, which should actually be not taken, right? So for i equals to 1,000, we do, um, again, mispredict. So B2, let's start. So for i is zero, it is weakly not taken, but it actually needs to be uh, taken, right? It's an even number. So we mispredict for i zero. And then, uh, so for i equals to zero, we mispredict, so from weekly not taken, we go to weekly taken. Then again, it becomes i equals to one. We are weekly taken, but actually we need to be not taken. Then we go to weekly not taken, and then this loops, and then we continue uh, like forever mispredicting. So here we had like two times uh, kind of like mispredicting this whole branch would have like a thousand times mispredicted. Okay. Let's just start with B3. So we're weekly not taken, but actually we need to take it because like we're less than 250. Then we go strongly taken, right? We train our weekly not taken over like these 250 times to be strongly taken. Uh, and then when we reach to 250 um, from that, so imagine, here we are strongly taken, but we reach to 250. So let's say to I, 250, we arrive, and then we say, that, okay, like I don't need to take this branch anymore. Why don't I make it weekly taken? And then we go to I, 251. And so, okay, we, I still don't need to take it. Then I can make it weekly not taken, which then I correctly mispredicted. Okay, it's not taken until end of life of this code, right? So we would have, three things again here. So for B4, same stuff happens. So again, we start with I0 is wrong because like, oh, it's weekly not taken, but I should actually be taken. So for I0, it's wrong. Then, um, then eventually I start being like strongly, the predictor becomes like strongly taken. Okay. Uh, but then I, um, 500 arrives and uh, it's okay. Like I should be mispredict. I go weekly taken. And then this one again, 501, I go weekly not taken. So overall, again, three. Uh, let's see what happens with the last branch. Okay. So here, I start with weekly not taken, which is fine because it's like more than 500. So it's it's good. It's always goes to strongly not taken. So when actually 500 starts, we are at a strongly not taken. But then we realize, okay, we need to actually take it. So we go well, like, how about weekly not taken? And then 501 would be uh, weekly taken. So we are kind of like fine. After that, because we take the branch, right? So it's two. So would be 1,010 over, uh, over that overall number that we had. So that will be our misprediction for the last case. OK, so uh, let's look at this uh, cache reverse engineering problem. So the question goes like this. You are trying to reverse engineer the characteristics of a cache in a system. 
so so that you can design a more efficient machine specific implementation of an algorithm you are working on to do so you have to come up with three sequences of memory accesses to various bytes in the system in an attempt to determine the following four cache characteristics so you are given cache blocks uh, the cache block size could be 8 8 bytes to 128 bytes uh, the cache associativity could be two way four way or eight way uh, cache replacement policy is either lru or fifo and cache size is four or eight kilobytes so the only statistic that you can collect on this system is cache hit rate after performing each sequence of memory accesses that uh, here is what you observe. So you are given three sequences of addresses which are accessed from oldest to youngest and the, for each sequence you are given a hit rate. So, the, uh, so we'll continue. Assume that the cache is initially empty at the beginning of the first sequence but not at the beginning of the second and the third sequence. The sequences are executed back to back that is, no other accesses take place in, in between sequences. Uh, so thus, at the beginning of, uh, of the second sequence, the contents are the same at the end of the first sequence. So once you access the first sequence, the second sequence will see the data that is already in the cache. At the beginning of the third sequence, the contents of the, are the same as, the, as at the end of the second sequence. So uh, based on what you observe, what are the following characteristics of the cache? Explain to get points. So uh, to get the cache block size, uh, in this question, we have to kind of use uh, the process of elimination and also try out different combinations. So uh, if the cache block, so in, for this uh, sub question to find the cache block size, we have to uh, basically explore all the different cache block sizes and see whether the hit rate that is given in for each sequence is, uh, uh, it's uh, it uh, it matches the hit rate that is given. So if we take the cache block size of uh, eight bytes, so uh, so let's say uh, you are uh, the first access zero goes into a particular in, goes to one of the cache blocks, which which can have addresses zero to seven, and then sixteen goes to another block, uh, twenty four goes to a new block because 16, we can uh, can store addresses up to 23. Uh, so 24 is the new block, but then 25 is, it belongs to the same block. So that would be considered a cache hit. And then you will have 1024 in a new block, 255 in a new, in a new block because these are not accessed before and these are all considered misses uh, the first time. And you will have one one zero zero and three zero five. So if you look at the number of hits that are uh, that you um, see in the sequence, uh, because uh, if the cache block size is eight bytes, you will see only one uh, hit, which is twenty five. So one by eight is not the hit rate that is given in the problem. So let's look at sixteen bytes. So here um, the the addresses that can be stored in a block will be 0 to 15, uh, 16 to 31, and so on. So uh, 0 goes to a uh, new block. Then um, 16 uh, will be the first, uh, will be considered a miss and will be stored in a new block. But then you will have 24 going to the same block and 25 going to the same block. So these two will be considered hits because the, the block will already contain the, uh, the block of addresses that are accessed. And you will have uh, 1024 is a miss and will be stored in the cache. Uh, 255 will be a miss and will be uh, added to a new block. 1100 will be a miss and will be added to a new block. And 305 will be a miss and will be added again uh, to a new block. So. Here you can see that the hit rate is two out of eight accesses, which matches matches the hit rate that is given in sequence one. So we have kind of figured out the uh, the cache size block size already. But if you want to try out more, uh, uh, I mean a higher cache block size, you can all, you can also try it out. So if you have thirty two bytes, then you will have zero will be the first address that is accessed and will be missed. Uh, then you 16 will also go to the same block because it can store 32 bytes. 
uh, then you will have 24 and 25 also in the same block. So these three will be considered its. And then uh, you will have 1024, 255, 1100. This will also go to a new block because can't be put in the same block as 1024. And then you will have 305. So you, you will have the cash hit rate of three out of eight. So as you keep increasing the, the block size, you will have uh, the hit rate also increases. So uh, if you try out 64 and 128, I'm sure you will have the same uh, result of three by eight. So uh, with this, you we have kind of figured out that the cache block size is 16 bytes. So any questions so far? Okay. So um, yeah, let's move to the next question, which is, uh, to find the cache associativity. So, so far what we have, uh, what we know is that the cache block size is 16 bytes. What we don't know is the cache associativity and uh, we don't know the replacement policy. We also don't know the, uh, the total cache size. So, um, so to do this, we have to figure out, uh, we have to again try out different combinations. Uh, uh, so we can start with, uh, with eight way cache. Uh, okay. So here again, because we have, uh, yeah, because we have uh, two possible cache sizes, which is uh, 4K or 8 kilobytes. Let's start with uh, the highest cache uh, size, which is 8 kilobytes. So let me draw a diagram of the the 8K uh, eight-way cache. Um, so you will have. Um, so uh, this is eight-way. And you will have a number of sets, uh, so zero to let's say n sets. How many? Uh, what is the value of n? You can figure out easily by um, uh, doing some math. So you can uh, divide the total cache to get the number of blocks. You have to divide the number of blocks. You have to just divide the total cache size divided by the block size, which is 16 bytes. And uh, to find the number of sets, you, uh, you basically uh, take this number of blocks and find and divide it by the associativity. So if, if it is eight, you will find the number of sets. Uh, so, uh, Okay, so now we have to figure out what uh, where each address in the sequence would actually go in in which set it would go. Uh, but as a thumb rule, we can we can uh, see that since it's eight way and eight kilobytes, uh, if you do the math on uh, the number of sets and how much uh, uh, the data can be uh, stored or the the different addresses that can be stored in different uh, sets, you will basically figure out that for set zero, you can actually store addresses like 0, 1024, 2048, uh, then uh, increments of uh, 1024 till, uh, uh, so any address which would be uh, multiple of 1024 would be basically can go to zero, uh, set zero. This you can, we can also find out using the uh, index bits in the, in the address. Uh, so, so basically, we'll we'll see uh, where each of these addresses go. So uh, when the sequence one starts, so we'll also measure the the cache hit rate for uh, uh, the cache hits for sequence uh, uh, one. So we'll store zero here, and then uh, sixteen would come somewhere next in the in the set one. Uh, so twenty four and twenty five will be uh, cache hits, as we saw earlier. Then you have 1024, which, which can be uh, 
placed in uh, set zero, and uh, so which is all which is considered a miss, and then you have two fifty five, which uh, which can be placed somewhere in one of the uh, one of the sets, uh, but it it doesn't really matter uh, now, and then you will also have one one zero zero, which could be placed in uh, uh, in one of the ways uh, in uh, 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 basically in uh, here or uh, or somewhere here also, depending on the availability of the the cache block. So so let's assume that it's uh, placed here. So then we also have three zero five. Okay, so uh, so we have a cache hit rate of two, but let's uh, see the second sequence. So this is sequence one. Now uh, sequence two, we have thirty one, uh, which is uh, which is uh, the block is already available. So it's sixteen is already there. So that will be a cache hit. Uh, then we have six five five three six, which which has not been accessed earlier, so it will be uh, added to uh, the set zero because it's also a multiple of uh, ten twenty four. So uh, this is uh, placed in set zero. Then we have since six five five three six is already there, the next access is six five five three seven, so which will be a cache hit, and. Um, the next address is one three one zero seven two, which is one twenty eight k, which which is not ac uh, accessed before, so it will get placed in one three one uh, set zero. And uh, similarly, two fifty six k is not accessed below uh, accessed before, so it, even that is a miss, and it it will be placed in uh, set zero. Now uh, we have eight, which is already the block block is already available in uh, set zero so it means that it's a cache hit and we also have uh, 30 we 305 is already there from the previous sequence so that is also a cache hit uh, so 1060 is is not available in the sequence which will be placed in uh, let's say somewhere here so that is a cache miss so we we have Four cache hits out of eight accesses, which means that it's uh, it doesn't satisfy the hit rate that is provided in the sequence. So, so eight way is uh, is still uh, a possibility because we haven't checked the four kilobyte cache size. So, uh, if you check the four kilobytes cache size, then you can actually see that set zero can uh, basically accommodate addresses like uh, zero, five, twelve, and uh, 1024 um, and increments of 512. So, uh, so you will still have addresses like 65536, 13, 128K, and 256K in the same set. Uh, and uh, since we don't have any address which is uh, close to 512, we, st we will still store 1024 in the set zero, and the result would be the same. So, it uh, even for even if we assume that the for eight way the the cache size is four kilobyte, we still get a hit rate of uh, four by eight. So this means that we we have to discard eight k as a possible eight way uh, ca associate uh, associativity as a possible possible answer. So then we move to uh, four way. So even in four way we have. Uh, uh, again, two possibilities. We have four kilobytes, and uh, or eight kilobytes. Okay, so uh, let's take eight kilobytes first. So uh, let me draw a block of uh, for the four-way associativity, and uh, you have again set zero to. In number of sets. Okay, so so here the set zero can uh, hold addresses like zero, ten, uh, two thousand forty-eight, uh, four zero nine six, 
and so on. So uh, I mean, I'm I'm trying to simplify the calculation here because I just divide uh, eight kilobyte by four way, and you kind of get the the offsets, uh, which can be stored in uh, block zero. So we look at the sequence again. So zero gets stored in block zero, in the set zero, and then sixteen would be in let's say set one. Um, so 24 and 25 will be cache hits. Uh, and you, you also get uh, uh, 1024, which would be stored somewhere uh, in one of the sets here. It's, it's not stored in um, set zero. And then you will have uh, 255 somewhere and um, 1100 and 305 so all these are um, considered misses because they are uh, cache misses because they are not accessed before so the only hits that are there is 24 and 25 now we continue to the second sequence so 31 uh, sequence to hits so 31 is uh, basically already there because 16 is uh, the, the block containing 16 um, is already present in the cache and that will be considered a cache hit. So 31. Now we go to 65536, uh, which is not there in the cache and it will be uh, placed in set zero. Uh, then we have 65537, which uh, which will be a cache hit because 65536 was just accessed. And then you have uh, uh, 131072, which is not accessed before. So you, you will place it in set zero. And you also have 262144, which is uh, 256K, which is not accessed before. And now you get you uh, have eight as the address access, so which is already available in set zero. Uh, so eight is a cache, cache hit, and uh, 305 is already uh, stored in the cache from the previous sequence. So you have 305, and you already see that there are four cache hits, which which uh, the violates the the problem statement. So uh, so instead of going further, we also look at uh, we we'll, we we'll look at uh, four way and um, uh, four kilobyte. So you have a number of sets and um, here because uh, yeah again if you uh, look at the index bits of the the block address you will find that uh, you will you can store set for set zero you, you can store zero one zero two four two zero four eight and so on so uh, let's go again with the the first sequence so you will have zero uh, which is a cash miss uh, 16 um, then you will have uh, two hits that we keep seeing for the sequence one 24 and 25 then you have 1024 which is stored in uh, set zero unlike the eight kilobyte cache where because of the larger size you had you could uh, fit it in one of the other sets uh, then you also have uh, somewhere you can store 255. Not sure if you can see the, the sequence. Yeah, you could store 255 somewhere here in one of the sets. And then you also have... Um, 1100, which is not accessed before, but you could place it in one of the sets, either uh, if the slot is empty in the in this column or in, in, in the second column. So let's 
uh, let's just play, place it in the second column. Uh, so then you also have 305. Uh, basically, for this, you can uh, calculate the the set and the offset, block offset, um, and you can place it in the in the right set. So, but for the sim for simplicity, we are not doing it in this problem because we are mostly focused on what goes into the in the into the set zero. So, so right now we have three not five here. Okay, now we'll we'll uh, closely look at what what would be the the cache hits in uh, sequence two. So 31 would be a cache hit because 16 is already there. Then you would place 65536, which is a miss, and it will go to the set zero. Uh, 65537 is uh, is access net next, and that would be placed in uh, this, uh, that would be uh, a cache hit because it, would, it is already available in the cache, the block. Six five five three seven, and then you have one three one zero seven two, which is also which can also be placed in the um, in the set zero. Now uh, the next thing is next address that comes. If it is if it belongs to set zero, then something has to be replaced. So so two six two fifty six k is also a multiple of uh, ten twenty four, and it can also be placed in set zero. Now. Uh, we have to explore two possibilities for the replacement. We have to check whether the LRU and P4 uh, replacement policies. But fortunately, we in this problem we have both LRU and P4 would would replace the uh, zero with the new address because zero is the first one that is accessed uh, in case of P4, and zero is also the last uh, least recently used. Um, address so yeah so uh, 262144 would be placed in uh, set 0 uh, instead of 0 and then uh, yeah so 8 is is a cache miss because we just replaced uh, the address 0 so 8 would have to uh, 8 would be replaced in um, instead of 1024 Um, it, it's the same, at, uh, I mean, the replacement block would be the same even for both LRU and FIFO. Um, then 305 would be a cache hit because it's there from the previous sequence and it's not replaced yet. And 1060 is, um, is, is um, it's a cache miss and will be placed somewhere, let's say here. So, so with four four by four kilobyte, you still get a cache hit ratio, uh, cache hit rate of three by eight. But we have to continue looking at the sequence three to verify if this this holds on. So now let's look at two six two one four five. So for sequence three, um, we already have two six two one four four in the set zero. So this would be a cache hit. And uh, 65536 is, is also there in the set zero, which is, uh, which is a cache hit. And four is the next address accessed and it's, it was recently replaced in set zero uh, by eight. So the entire block would be there and four can also be a cache hit. So you, you have got three by uh, three as the hit rate, which is actually not, not the say, not what is mentioned in the problem statement. So it you still uh, you have at this point you can also discard four way associativity, and by process of elimination you can straight away um, answer that it's it's a two way cache. But uh, if you have time, you can also verify by uh, with uh, two way. Um, associativity also but uh, yeah so since we have eliminated from um, eliminated the other answers we uh, will continue with the next question so do you have any questions so far 
Okay. So uh, next look at next we look at what is the cash replacement policy that we need to uh, that uh, we need to find. Uh, what is the replacement policy, whether it's LRU or FIFO? And so far, what what we know is that the cash block size is uh, sixteen bytes, and it is two way set associative cash. So. Yeah, so with uh, LRU and uh, or FIFO, we still have uh, two more variables to find LRU or FIFO. We we can we should still consider four kilobyte total cache size or eight kilobyte, and also we we should check for LRU and FIFO. Okay, so let's look at um, a four kilobyte cache with a two-way associativity. So let me just draw this diagram so this is set zero and um, uh, you will have n sets in the cache okay so uh, yeah so uh, with with this uh, again you can find the set from the uh, you can decode the, the set from the address, but uh, if I quickly do it, the set at set zero can hold um, addresses like zero, since it's four kilobyte and divided by two way, it, it can hold two zero four eight, four zero nine six, and so on. And most of these addresses like six sixty four k, one twenty eight k, and two fifty six k fall into set zero. So. Uh, so let's start uh, uh, accessing the addresses and then uh, placing it in the cache blocks. So you have zero here and you would place 16 in the next block uh, because our block size is 16 bytes and you, uh, you will get 24 and 25 as cache hits from sequence one. Then you would have some, have 20, 10, 20, when 20, 10, 24 comes, you, it's still a miss because it's accessed the, for the first time and you would place it somewhere in one of the sets uh, and not in set zero. And next comes 255. So you would place it somewhere between that in one of the sets. Then you will have 1100 and uh, 305 uh, should be placed between after 255 in one of the sets. Sorry for the crude uh, way of uh, drawing, but then uh, I hope you understand the, the idea behind this. So once this is done, you still have a slot left in the, or one, uh, one only one way is utilized in the, in the cache in, in set zero. So next you see that 31. Uh, so at this point, we, we have completed, completely gone over the sequence one. Now we'll go to sequence two. So 31 is the next address. So we'll, if we keep track of sequence two hits, so 31 would be a hit because 16 is already present in the cache. Then you have 65536. Because there is a empty, uh, one of the ways is still empty. We, we place 65536 in, uh, in set zero. And uh, 65537 would be a cache hit because we just placed 65536. And now um, we, we get one, uh, 128K uh, as the next address. Now we need to decide um, which, ad which replacement policy to take. So if we, if we go with LRU, let's, let's go with LRU for now. So if we, um, for this address, if we go with LRU, the, the least recently used was zero in set zero. So this would be evicted and uh, replaced with uh, 131072. Okay, so that was a cache miss anyway. So then we, we get the address 262144, which is also a miss because it was not accessed earlier. And it has to be replaced. It, it has to replace one of these two blocks in uh, in the set zero. Now, which one would it replace? Because we just replaced uh, zero with uh, the previous address. 
uh, this is the least recently used. 65536 is the least recently used. So we'll replace that with 2621144. Okay. So uh, next comes eight. So eight is also not present in the in the cache at this point. So we take eight and place it uh, in again. It belongs to set zero. Um, but where should we place it? Because it's uh, because we have uh, two recent accesses and we should find the least recently used out of that. So we uh, we replace one three one zero seven two with eight. And once the once eight is completed, we will move on to three zero five. Three zero five has uh, is already there from the previous sequence and it has not been evicted here. And we also have one zero six zero, which um, which is a new access and it has it can be placed uh, somewhere here. Okay. Uh, so three zero five was also a cache hit. Now with LRU access, LRU replacement policy, we still satisfy the the two sequences. But let's look at the third sequence. So with two six two one four five. So at this point, the cache uh, set zero looks like this: eight and two six two one four four. So we we will see the the se sequence three hits. So two six two one four five would be a hit because. Um, to see, it's already there in the cache. Now, uh, 65536 comes. So 65536 has to replace one of these two. And uh, we need to look at which one was uh, accessed uh, um, uh, most uh, least recently used. So because there was an access here to the same cache block in the third sequence, uh it it isn't uh, this one is uh, is not not the least recently used the least recently used was eight okay so so because we see that it was accessed here and there was an there was an access to this cache block 262144 containing 262144 so we replace eight with 65536 Okay, so 65536 again is, is a miss and it has replaced the previous uh, uh, cache uh, entry. And now we have four. So four is is a, is again a miss because with set zero, you don't have six, uh, uh, it, it contains six, 64K and 256K at this point and you don't have uh, zero. So even that is a miss. And uh, that will probably replace uh, this entry because that was the least recently used at this point. So, so you you only have one out of three as the cash hit rate with uh, in the third sequence, which is a violation of what is what the problem says. So, again, you can actually uh, kind of eliminate uh, LRU at this point. And if you have time, you can also go and check for uh, the other com uh, other possibility or other combination of um, two-way eight kilobytes, and it still gives an answer of uh, FIFO. So we only checked for one of the combinations here. So LRU with two-way and four kilobytes actually did not satisfy. So you uh, so the the replacement po policy should satisfy all the different combinations that are there. So it, it so we basically uh, eliminate LRU and then the answer would be FIFO. Any questions so far? Okay. So now the last question is uh, to identify the cache size, four four or eight kilobytes. You can access two addresses right after the sequence three. That is, the contents are the same as at the end of third sequence, and measure the cache hit rate. Which two addresses would you choose and explain your answer? There could be multiple uh, correct answers. So to, to find this, uh, for this uh, sub-question, the, the, so what do we know so far? So we know that um, the associativity is two-way and uh, the cache block size is 16 bytes and uh, the replacement policy is FIFO. 
okay so now to find out if there if the cache total cache size is 4 kilobytes or 8 kilobytes um, we need to uh, and uh, let me also draw the the most recent uh, state of the uh, of the cache if it is uh, two way set associative so uh, okay yeah for that we need to actually do the fifo uh, also um, maybe let me do it quickly so uh, this this is set 0 and you have multiple sets so you have zero stored here then 16 somewhere and i'll i'll focus more on uh, set zero at this point so uh, if it is 8 kilobytes uh, and uh, 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 two way associative then you will have addresses like 04096 8192 um, addresses like that going into the set zero um, now we uh, 1024 actually goes somewhere in one of the sets um, i'll ignore the 255 110 and 305 um, okay so in the second sequence we will have 31 which is a cache hit then we will have 65536 and uh, 65537 uh, uh, so uh, let me write down the sequence two hits so you have 31 65537 and 128k uh, would be the next address and that has to replace uh, in uh, using FIFO replacement policy. So it still uh, goes and uh, replaces zero because that was the first address that came. So it is uh, 131072. And then you have uh, 262144, which is also a new address and that has to replace the this um, 64K address because that was the least recently, you, the, that was the first address that came. Uh, so 262144 and then you also have 8 in the uh, in the sequence so 8 has to has to be accommodated in set 0 again and uh, 8 will replace uh, the first one which came between these two addresses so it will replace this and uh, then you have uh, 305 and uh, 1060. So the cache hits at this point are again 3 by 8. And then uh, the next, let's go to sequence 3 quickly. So you have 262145, which is a hit. Then, um, then this has to, this is a new address uh, and has to be replaced in the set 0. So if it is if this uh, has to replace one of these two addresses, and if it is fee for replacement policy, then it has to replace the first one that came, and not necessarily the most recently accessed. So it will replace two six two one four four because eight came after two six two one four four. So that will replace six five five three six. So um, so in sequence three, you already have one cache it, and then. This is a cache miss and four is a cache hit because eight is already available in the cache. So that also kind of uh, uh, matches the hit rate that is given in the problem. Now, uh, so the recent uh, for the third, for the last sub question. So we have, uh, I wanted to draw the, the recent state of the cache. So you have eight and you have six, five, five, three, six. Okay. so. Uh, so as I mentioned that we need to find, we need to add two more addresses to the sequence to figure out whether the cache size is four kilobytes or eight kilobytes. So if it is, uh, let's say, uh, um, four kilobytes, then your set zero can contain addresses like uh, 2048, 4096, and increments of 2048. But if it is eight kilobytes, then you have um, addresses that can go to set zero, like zero, 
फोर जीरो नाइन सिक्स एट वन नाइन टू एंड सो ऑन अगेन यू कैन डी कोड दिस यूजिंग द इंडेक्स बिट्स ऑफ द एड्रेस सो so at this point we need to actually uh, the the technique to do uh, to figure out the between 4k or 8 kilobytes is um, you need to actually find an address which which uh, results in a cache miss in both of them in both 4 kilobytes and 8 kilobyte 4 kilobyte and 8 kilobyte uh, cache design but then in one of them it it actually goes and replaces the set zero block so yeah that is that is the first address the second address what we need to uh, the second address that we need to use is we need to access the previous uh, occupant of that cache block to see if there is a cache uh, hit or a cache miss so with 4 kilobyte uh, we need to find the address which results in a cache miss first time in, uh, with the first address and also a cache miss in the second sequence because it has replaced uh, it was the let's for example take 8 with if we if we have a new uh, address in this uh, or in the first uh, or basically in the in the next two addresses if we choose an address which replaces 8 then it results in a cache miss but then we go ahead and uh, we the next address would be we still go and access 8 to see if it is uh, a cache miss or not but in case of 8 kilobyte we because we choose a new address we it will still be a cache miss but then if uh, if it's not evict if the set zero has not been evicted then it results in a cache hit so that is how we kind of differentiate between the two addresses and between, between the two cache uh, designs so um we we see that there is uh, uh we 409696 is common across 4 kilobytes uh, addresses which can go to set 0 but we have 2048 so uh, which is not uh, there in 8 kilobytes so so if there is if it is 2048 it actually goes to uh, in a 8 kilobyte design it will if it is set 0 it will basically go to one of the sets in the one of the other sets so it will uh, will go go somewhere here but in case of 2 uh, 4 uh, kilobyte uh, sequence uh, uh, in the system it actually uh, replace it has to replace uh, one of these two addresses and going by fifo it has to replace uh, um yeah so if it is p4 then uh, we uh, 8 came first so it would replace 8 with 2048 so with 2048 it results in a cache miss in both 8 kilobytes and 4 kilobytes uh, systems now if we uh, choose a, the second address that we need to choose should basically go and access the previous entry which was 8 or any address in that block 0 to 15 because in in 8 kilobyte uh, system we still have 8 uh, uh, in present in set 0 so if we choose 0 as the second address then uh, this would result in a cache miss which is 4 kilobyte system and in 8 kilobytes you would result you would get a cache hit so uh, if if you access these two addresses 2048 and 0 uh, 0 or um, you could also access any of the uh, other in uh, other addresses in the 4 kilobyte uh, range uh, which belongs to set 0 that doesn't uh, belong to 8 kilobyte uh, set 0 addresses and you you still get you could access one of those addresses instead of 2048 and you could still use any of the addresses between 0 to 15 to figure out if there is a cache miss or a cache hit so with this uh, this uh, kind of uh, behavior you can figure out if it's a 4 kilobyte or a 8 kilobyte system okay uh, so we will still have two more exercise uh, 
Rahul and Gagan is, uh, will come to solve. So I, as a quick uh, correction, I checked uh, those question, um, equation that I wrote. There, are, there, is, uh, there is still uh, one uh, simple bug. So here should be J minus four. So all of them should be J minus four. Here also, here, here, and this one. So for those that you, you know, the two can note, note please uh, correct them. I will also uh, post a nice and correct equation on Moodle for your references. This was a bonus question in the last, last year. Uh, so it's based on the runhead execution, uh, which uh, you have Professor Mudlu has covered in lecture 25, if I'm not wrong. So as, you, as this is a pretty small question. So let's get this done quickly. So it says that, okay, a runhead execution processor, I mean, hopefully you all know the runhead execution by, by this time anyway, right? So it, it just mentions that, okay, it, uh, we have created another processor which has a runhead execution, but it's an un unintended bug that every other instruction uh, is run ahead in the run ahead mode is dropped by the processor after the phase stage. So basically you, once we enter the run ahead stage, you execute it incorrectly. So, and then the question, uh, the following qu three questions ask for this bu buggy processes, what, what, what is supposed to happen with this processor? Okay, so as you, as it says that all other behavior of the run ahead mode is exactly as we described in the lecture 25A, if I remember correctly. So, so yeah, and then, then we need to uh, uh, explain which of them, the, which of these following questions are correct. So the first question says that, okay, the buggy runhead processor finishes the program correctly and faster than the non-buggy runhead processors. The answer is obviously yes, that uh, it, it can happen. Why? Because um, let's say, even if the processor is dropping every other instructions, but then it, it's actually by dropping every other instruction, it's probably finding more uh, dependent uh, memory instructions to you know, execute in the runhead mode. So that might be one reason that, okay, it's, it's executing correctly as well as faster than the normal processor, which doesn't have the runhead execution. Uh, okay, so the second question is that the, the buggy runhead processor finishes the program correctly but the slower than the non-buggy runhead processor. So is this also possible? The answer is yes. Why? Because uh, let's say if, if the memory instructions are actually present in the alternate instructions that are getting dropped by this bug that, that is present in the processor, then what might happen is that uh, in the non-buggy runhead processors would actually you know, explore much more uh, memory dependent memory instructions than the buggy runhead processors. And as a result, what would happen is that the non-ahead, non-buggy run-ahead processes would, uh, you know, run faster because they have explored uh, much more dependent memory instructions in the run-ahead mode. So, so yeah, this is also possible. Uh, the third point is that the buggy run-ahead processor executes the program incorrectly. The, the this answer is definitely no. Why? Because if you recollect what happens in the run-ahead execution, is that no matter what happens in runhead execution mode, nothing gets committed. So that's the that's a crucial part of this question because just because nothing gets committed means that whatever changes that you make inside the runhead mode, it cannot be permanent. So it 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 does not affect the program execution correctness. So so basically, the entire uh, uh, let's say mindset of creating this pro pro problem is that no matter what happens, it can actually run, like even if you have some hardware bug in the, in the processor implementation in the runhead mode, it can actually create uh, the buggy processor to run faster or the slower than the non-buggy processor, but no matter what happens, it cannot actually run incorrect execution. So, so yeah, so that's, that's the mindset of this problem and, and that's the question in a nutshell. Uh, so this one is the final question. Uh, it's on uh, systolic arrays and we are doing convolution. So it's uh, quite an easy question. So I expect you guys will get like full points in this one. Uh, so first we have like a systolic array, which is like four by four, uh, which is arranged in like a spatial manner, which is 2D. Um, 
and uh, you know how systolic array does it just propagates like if you have uh, an input uh, which you provide from the top and it propagates into O1 and same from from the left side we have another input it propagates to the output and inside there's a register which does a MAC operation so MAC is nothing but a multiply accumulate so whatever value which is there already uh, it will add uh, uh, and the multiplica multiplication of inputs uh, and that's how this process and then it will just propagate the, the inputs to further uh, processing elements and what we are doing is we are doing convolution uh, so over here we have like four different convolution which we have to perform on the same pro uh, pro uh, processing element array uh, we already give an example of one of the convolutions uh, which is for the first one uh, let's try another one if we have if you want to do a conv convolution of uh, uh, input i z uh, this uh, input with the uh, with this you can call it weights uh, uh, b uh, b vector so in that case what what we do is it's just like point uh, dot product of all the values so in case we need to get this x zero to get the x zero value we do a dot product of so it's it's just a filter so you get this b0 kernel which moves on top of the input first so we'll do a multiplication here so it will be i00 multiplied by b00 plus i01 multiplied by b01 and then we go to the next row when we do 10 e10 plus i11 b1 so this will give, give us the the output of x00 and similarly we will do for all of these and uh and the same fashion we do like different vect vectors as well c and d so if we want to map this sort of operation on a processing element uh we it's easy if i draw it here and show how this these values propagate so for example we have these uh, let's do just the first row and first column uh, they all are connected so for example now we need to do the first uh convolution for i vector with the a vector and what and you can map like you you can provide input from the top or you can provide the the weight vec vector which is the a vector whichever way you prefer so for example if we give give uh i vector from the top so we will give i is zero zero yeah and from this side we give zero zero so yeah so if you think about this h zero which is yeah visual so on the first cycle uh on h zero we are giving a zero zero and on the v zero we give i zero zero so in this uh, PE, PE0, we perform the, the multiplication of uh, A00 and I00, which is this part. And, and then it will propagate both the values. I00 will go down, A00 will go further on the right. And, and if you see in this calculation, uh, A00 is being reused for uh, doing the multiplication for different weights. Uh, for uh, w01 w10 w11 so we can go either way we can uh, first calculate in the row or in the column and uh, you will see how it propagates so in the first cycle uh, we finish this one and in the next cycle this a00 is propagated to the pe01 so now if we want to perform this next calculation we need i01 and a01 a00 is already propagated so what we do is on v1 we provide i01 so on cycle number one on v1 we provide i01 so now we are able to do this calculation and now if we look at the third one we again reuse a00 so we already propagated a00 here in pe02 and to perform this calculation we need i10 so what we do is on v2 we do i02 so in the next cycle on v2 we give i02 and similarly for pe03 
we can again reuse A00. And here we need A11. Okay, so next cycle we got. Is it clear? Or all right, cool. And now similarly, so now we can go in like the the vertical direction as well in the in the column. And now what's happening is we need I00 and we check like where the I00 is being reused. So we propagate I00. And if you look at this calculation for B0, which I did here for X00, so we need I0. So what's missing is B00. So what we do is like we give B00 as the input to H1. Is it clear? All right, cool. So on the H1, it's happening after one cycle because it takes one cycle to propagate down and it takes one pro uh, cycle to propagate in any direction. So now we give B0, zero, zero. and now I0 propagates further. And now we can on H2. And similarly, like we did for B0, zero, zero. in the case of uh, when we are calculating Y0, zero, zero, we need uh, we will do C00 dot product with I00. So again, we can reuse. So it will be here C00. So similarly, here will be D00. Okay. And now we come, now we already did all the calculations for, uh, we propagated through all the PEs. So now what we do is like on the first, uh, so this one is not being used. So now we can load the next, we can start the next calculation, which will be A01. Yeah, so we can start with the calculation of this part now. So similarly, we'll do the same thing again. So now we get A01 and you can, sorry, it's really tiny to write, but yeah. So we get A0, is it clear? Like, can you see it? Or, because it's a bit hard to write it down. Okay, so now we get A01 here and now we do it the same manner. Like we can propagate in this, either in this direction in the in the same row or we can go down in in the column so if we do it in a similar fashion so now to calculate this middle part we need i01 so on v0 uh, we get i01 here now i01 this will be i02 This is I one one, I one two. So now we complete this uh, in the in the same row. Now we do the similarly in the column. We go down. So for the column, it would be now we need we reuse with uh, I zero one in the column. So we check like where I zero one is needed. Again, it would be in this calculation. So the next element. So we will get B zero one here. C01, B01. So we'll keep on doing in this manner. Uh, so this one will be A00, A01. Maybe I'll use a different pen. Now we'll get A10 here. So if we start with this calculation, now we can start over here. So A01 will be used for I10. I one one two zero I two one and similarly it will be used uh, now we will reuse I one zero which will be used for B one zero C one zero and D one zero and now again we will change we will start with the last one so we need to load A one one over here. So we'll, instead of A01, we'll get A11. And here we'll get I11. So we start with A11. Here we get I11. So for the next one, we reuse A11 again. One, two, I21. Here we get I22. And now we go for the uh, in the same column, so we reuse I11. So I11 will be reused for B11, C11, 
in D11. So if you see, we calculate, we get all the values. And this first PE, P01, uh, P00, we'll calculate the, we'll have all the sums uh, for weight zero. Zero, zero, yeah, weight zero. Uh, next PE, uh, we'll, we'll, it, it's propagating the results and also ca uh, calculating zero, one, all the values for zero, one. W10 will be P0, one, one. And then if we go for P E zero, one, zero, it will have results for over here, yeah. Yeah, so this one will calculate X zero, zero in the next cycle. So everything is pipeline, zero, one, one, zero. And afterwards, we also did for the C, it was Y zero, P Y zero, zero, Y zero, one. And the next we'll be calculating, which is P three zero, which is this one. This one will have all the values for Z zero, zero. Zero one. Yeah. So this is how it would look like. So the I would suggest if you want to solve it, the easiest way is to just start with one, which is like just do the first convolution, do the weights, and everything is kind of like pipeline. So you you would do the same for everything else, and go in both the di direction. First go in the whichever you prefer, like row or column or whichever. Finish that and then start with the next one and it keeps on propagating. So this is how it would look like. You have any questions or?